Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the regular council meeting for Wednesday, June 7th to order. We'll just wait for that background noise to clear off. It takes a second sometimes. So the town of Comox respectfully acknowledges that we are standing on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation people, traditional keepers of the land. And I do want to mention that Comox First Nation has a national Indigenous Peoples Day coming up on Wednesday, June 21st, that the community is welcome to celebrate. And we will uh, review that correspondence later, but it is on Wednesday, June 21st from 3 to 7 with public events for families, individuals to go down and check out some of the events. And that will be coming up later on the agenda. So if I can get a mover of the adoption of the agenda for June 7th, all in favor? That's approved, thank you. So we have three delegations this evening. We'll ask for each delegation to come up to the podium, turn on the microphone, and you'll have up to 10 minutes to speak. And we will go through those three delegations and council may have some questions for you after your presentation. So I will call Tim Ennis for the BC Community BAT Program to talk about the certification of Comox as a BAT friendly, BAT friendly community. So welcome, Tim. Red, red is good. Okay, perfect. Well, hello everybody, and thank you for uh, for having me today. My name is Tim Ennis. I'm the regional coordinator for the North Island chapter of the BC Community BAT Program, and I'll try to be brief today because I know you have lots on your agenda. Um, oh, I should just add that the the North Island chapter of the BC Community Bat Co Program is co-sponsored by the Comox Valley Land Trust and the Cumberland Community Forest Society as sort of the hosting agencies. And that, that's important that we do. Where am I going? Down arrow. There we go. Perfect. So really briefly, why are bats important? Um, there's 12 species on Vancouver Island. We just discovered three of them for the first time through our program. Um, about half of them are considered species at risk. They're, all of our bats are insectivorous, um, and therefore they provide really important natural ecosystem services to our communities, including um, not just to the agriculture sector, um, but also to the forestry sector, as well as to sort of human comfort. Um, for example, one little brown bat can eat its body weight in mosquitoes every single night. So that's about a thousand mosquitoes per little brown bat in the community. So um, when we think about mosquito control, this is a, a pretty significant a contribution to the human comfort in our communities. Unfortunately, bats are also really threatened. Again, I mentioned half of them are species at risk now. Um, unfortunately, this year we had the first detection of what's called white mouse syndrome in British Columbia. This is a, a disease that's been affecting bats across North America since its introduction from Europe in approximately 2006. And as you can see on the map here, it's been slowly moving its way westward from New York uh, to here. Uh, it was first detected in, in Grand Forks. Um, so not super close to us here, but it is right on our doorstep in Puget Sound. This is a disease that um, will kill approximately 99% of little brown bats in a, in a hibernating colony. So it's a very significant potential loss. Um, and of course, wind, cur wind turbines, cats, and things, collisions with vehicles are all, all you know, stressing our, our bat population. So given how important they are, uh, it's really um, a incumbent upon us now to do what we can sort of make sure that the populations remain healthy in our communities. Uh, so the BC Community Bat Program is set up to do just that. Um, we're a provincial body uh, that's coordinated provincially with regional and local chapters. So again, we're the North Island chapter that operates from basically here north to, to Port Hardy. Um, and we do a number of things, um, including annual bat counts or so monitoring populations at particular roost sites. Uh, but we also promote um, bat-friendly communities, which is uh, an important component of what we do uh, as a program, and that's similar to why I'm here to speak to you today. Um, but we also support landowners who may have bats in their buildings, which is fairly common. Um, you know, residents here in Comox and other places, when they discover they've got bats in their building, they have a place to phone to get practical science-based information about what they should do about that. Um, so we're there to, to answer the other end of the phone and, and walk them through the processes of making good decisions for themselves and for, and for bats as well. And then, of course, education and outreach uh, is a pretty critical component of the program as well. So what is a bat-friendly community? Um, well, uh, 
you know, we, we recognize that uh, bats live here in the town of Comox, and we uh, bat friendly communities are, are communities that identify where their bat habitats are, that support those habitats by installing bat boxes where appropriate, uh, provide literature to the public and uh, other targeted audiences about bat, bat conservation, and then communities that are also supporting education and outreach initiatives in particular. Um, and then, of course, each community has its own unique uh, creative ideas, and that uh, could, could possibly be more than that too, but in its own sort of area that fits with, with, uh, with the community. So here's just a, a screenshot of the Town Comox website um, talking about uh, its uh, movement towards uh, becoming a bathroom community or its ambitions to do so. And the Town of Comox has actually done quite a lot in this regard, so we're really, really pleased. Um, we've identified where uh, that habitats are within the town. Um, and we've supported um, some of those habitats with the installation of bat boxes and attributive signage um, to sort of speak to what those bat boxes are. There's been a lot of education and outreach activities that have taken place, including, of course, um, the proclamation of Bat Week by Mayor Arnott in 2022. Um, and the Philburg in particular has done a great job of creating bat friendly gardens, bat friendly seed packages, so other people can create bat friendly gardens in their homes. Um, the list is quite long. Um, so if Comox were to pursue becoming a bat friendly community, what are the ongoing commitments? Um, essentially commit, committing to um, ongoing maintenance of the bat boxes that have been currently installed, uh, continuing to provide literature to the general public online, um, as well as through the municipal office, continuing to pro pro proclaim bat week each, each year, continuing to support educational opportunities, and exploring other ways that we can find to uh, promote bat conservation within the town of Comox. So we feel that um, currently the town of Comox is in a place where it does satisfy the criteria to become a bat friendly community. Um, so if council is, is so interested, um, we have a proposed motion here to uh, encourage that, that staff apply to the program to become officially a bat friendly community. If that were to happen, Comox would be the first bat friendly community on Vancouver Island, which I think would be kind of, kind of neat to see happen. Other, other bat friendly communities currently include Dawson Creek, Richmond, Delta, Port Moody, and Beachland. So it's a, an emerging and growing program. Uh, so we hope that the town of Comox will find that uh, of interest and be willing to pursue that designation through an application from staff to our program. And that's the end of my presentation. But of course, I'm happy to take comments or questions. Thank you, Tim. And I was going to mention that it's on our staff recommendation list tonight to be a bat friendly community. And I know we've had some education and interaction with the public, you know, in the past couple of years on this. And so far, it's been really positive, even with questions coming forward and people have questions. It's, it's been a positive start to finish communication. So thank you for your work so far on that. Questions from the council? Councillor Scott. Thanks, Tim. I'm just wondering of uh, the uh, bat boxes that have been installed. Do you know whether they're occupied or not? This is part of the work we're hoping to do this summer because a lot of them have been very recently installed. And so we'll be looking to um, go investigate that uh, throughout the, the coming field season ahead of us and uh, determine whether they're being used or not. It would be typical for, um, for them to not be used in the first few years because it takes a little while for bats to find them, so, so, so to speak not quite the same as putting up a swallow box where it seems like they're almost instantly occupied. Um, it takes a little bit longer with that, but um, I feel that we've got um, the best designs, the best locations, everything's been done to the highest standard. So I'm, I'm optimistic that they will, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Hazlitt. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, what's the cost of one of the bath boxes, as well as what would be the process if someone were to say, call and say, rather than the house on the property? And they were hoping for you guys to be able to probably do it from there. Sure. Well, to your first question, um, the bad boxes are easily, well, not easily, but they can be made by one's self by looking on our website and finding the plans. The plans are designed for one sheet of plywood so that you make all the cuts really precisely and don't waste any wood. So if you've got sort of basic carpentry skills, you can put one together yourself. But for those that don't, we make them available basically at cost, which depends on the plywood's plywood, but is generally around 200 dollars for the designs that we prefer um, and in terms of uh, what do we do if we find uh, bats in uh, someone's house and they no longer uh, wish them to be there um, it's illegal for a, a homeowner to do anything that would harass or negatively affect the bat so what happens is we wait until the bats leave the building which they always do in 
late, sort of late fall, early winter, and then guide the landowner through the process of how to seal up their building appropriately so that bats can't get back in following spring, which they will try to do. Um, but hopefully, uh, we'll also be able to put up uh, bat boxes so that when they do come back looking for a place to live, that they've got somewhere um, nearby that would be suitable for them. Councillor Mayor and then Councillor Blackwell. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Hey, um, I have two questions. So one is a, about like what success would look like. Like, do we have enough of a population for self-sustaining, or do we need to increase population? And like, what do we need to do to get there? And then the second question is if you could please share like your favorite fact now or your favorite fact story so that we can oh, all gosh. appreciate I, thoughts as much as we do. You guys have a long agenda today, so that's a dangerous question. Um, well, what I would say is that right now our bat population seems super healthy. Um, we, we haven't got white nose syndrome yet and we haven't seen real declines from some of the migratory species that are negatively affected by wind turbines. It's just that we know those things are coming. And so the time is now to do what we can to sort of support uh, bats by protecting their habitat, mitigating threats to them to the degree possible, and um, and where necessary, um, providing compensatory habitat. So, for example, if we've lost a lot of tree cover in a particular area in the valley, bat boxes make a lot of sense because a lot of the bats were used in troops. And if you have lost lots of old growth trees or snags, bat boxes are a great way to sort of support that habitat that's that's missing. We may have lots of great wetlands, um, and the estuary is really good for insect foraging as well. But if there's not, um, you know, the kind of roosting structures uh, any longer in a particular community, then that box is like a ton of sense. Um, fun facts. Uh, well, uh, let me think here. It's not not going to be too hard. Uh, well, we have a thing called the Mexican free tail bat that's newly newly discovered on Vancouver Island. It's not typically known to be here, but we've discovered it regularly. Uh, we think it might be a sort of a climate change migrant that's moving north as the climate becomes more appropriate, but otherwise be native to sort of northern um, California, southern Oregon. Uh, and it can fly 180 kilometers an hour. Fun fact. <laughs> Faster than you're driving on the Island Island Highway, I hope. That's a great question. Thanks for that, Councillor Blacklock. Uh, you identified a few of the teams uh, we signed up for to be able to have that kind of community. Is there any cost involved for the town to go to to the claim to all that kind of community? Well, okay, good. And then what would define or what would be some elements of a uh, an unfriendly garden versus a friendly garden to that? Well, I think the friendliness mm -hmm. of your garden depends on its ability to produce insects that would be prey to a moth. I mean, the bats. So, such as like, um, you know, we, we have at Gilbert here gardens that are designed for moth pollination, for example. We've, we've heard of butterfly gardens, right? And there are lots of people that find butterfly gardens. Well, that's great for daytime, but nighttime, moth pollinators are important food species for, for certain bats. So, you know, flowers that are white, that are scented, uh, especially at night, um, you just put a long list of things like that. There's other things you can do, like, kind of, you know, there's a trend that do what's called no mow may where you don't mow your lawn in June. I'm super excited when June first came along. Uh, what about deer predation or predation nets? Are those a danger to bats? Yeah, there's a few things that can be, um, you know, even simple things like having a plastic bucket in your attic. If the bat can get into the plastic bucket, it won't be able to climb back out of it. Or like um, fly traps to contain the traps that um, catch insects can also catch bats that are attacked to those same insects. And believe it or not, they're actually strong enough to, to hold some of the bats stuck there. Yeah, so there's things that you wouldn't think about that you can impose hazards. But from what I've experienced so far, um, most of the trouble that we've seen with injured bats is coming from cats that, um, you know, have, have figured out how to catch a bat and then make it a regular habit. So we have a close relationship with Mars, the Wildlife Hospital in the North Island there. And so um, we work with them to support um, bats that are patients there and then help them to find the release box for the particular species. But out of the ones that don't make it, a lot of them are out of caps with the appropriations. Thank you. Council Kirk. Thanks, Tim, and thanks to you and your team for all the work you're doing on this. Um, I, I was you know, lucky to attend a couple of the education sessions you had at, at Bilberg, and the, the echolocation kind of tracking that you're doing is really interesting. So anyone that's is here or or listening afterwards to this meeting, I, I encourage you to attend those sessions. They're really, really fascinating. 
Uh, my question is one of a competitive nature. I heard there's a another town uh, village nearby, which I'll remain nameless, that is also applying uh, in the process of applying for that family community. If we perhaps uh, approve this tonight, would we beat them to the punch? Uh, yes, you would. <laughs> But I think, um, you know, that's a great, great question. And it's honestly a truthful answer. But um, I think what would be wonderful is if the town of Comox not only approved the motion, but decided to reach across the river to other communities here in our region and supported uh, Comox and the Indomir Regional District and then uh, Comox First Nation to uh, seek out the same designation. It would be a great leadership um, piece for the town of Comox to do. Perfect. I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank and that you will so be much. on the agenda later. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Julie McKish for Aspen Hector Properties for comments and recommendations on site design by neighboring residents. So welcome, Julie, and you will have 10 minutes and the mic goes away. Thank you. So my name is Julie Mitch, and I'm a registered biological technician with the College of Applied Biology. My presentation today will focus on the proposed site plans for Hector and Aspen Roads by developers High Street Ventures and Broad Street Properties during their open house last March. Of course, our neighborhood wishes we could keep our neighborhood as is, low density and surrounded by green space, trees and nature. However, we all knew the change was inevitable each time a property was sold. What was unexpected was the fast paced movement towards high density and multi story buildings, especially since the original zoning for this area was single family large lots and country residential. To quickly recap my last presentation on May 3rd. The red listed wetland on the left side of this photo on Broad Street's property is documented within the BC Conservation Database. The same wetland type seen here on the right side of the photo was observed and reported by Satori Environmental Consultants in an environmental impact assessment for High Street Ventures did in March 31st, 2023. Both wetlands can likely be protected under the BC Government's Water Sustainability Act. Today, I'm here present, representing a community of residents concerned about the rate and intensity of densification and its potential effects on this area. On November 6, 2022, approximately 60 local residents gathered on Hector Road to express their concerns with regards to the rezoning and development of Hector and Aspen Roads from low density to high density housing. During this meeting and through letters I've received from neighbors, the top concerns expressed here were loss of trees, forests and wetlands, increased traffic height, well, oh, sorry, increased traffic, height of buildings, and impact to public services. Today, I will focus on the top three. These concerns are justified and become more apparent when you've had the opportunity to stroll or bicycle along our rural roads and around the properties proposed for development. Seen in this slide is one of our community's favorite walking and biking trails. It is a well-used trail as it links Hector to Aspen. If the current development proposal goes through its plan, this trail will be destroyed and replaced with parking lots and landscape paths and could potentially look like this. This is the current greenway to the northwest of the Aspen and Hector properties. The greenway has been urban landscaped and hydro seeded with grass and planted with non-native trees that look unhealthy and dead. The growing conditions here are harsh, too wet through winter and too dry through summer, both conditions likely due to the veget due to loss of vegetation and replaced with pavement and lawn. Currently, our local CVRD roads are rural in design and structure. For the most part, these roads are imperfect, uneven, and narrow, lined by ditches and bordered primarily with native vegetation. No street lights or sidewalks are present. In comparison, the streets adjacent to local Broad Street and High Street properties are barren, busy, and high highly developed, having little to no vegetation bordering them. Currently on the High Street and Broad Street properties, there is still intact second growth forest remaining. In these areas, there are still opportunities to observe nature, flora, na native flora and fauna. 
beautiful wildlife trees containing potential nesting cavities for birds and bats. Platforms as well as habitat for amphibians, reptiles, and small and large mammals remain. In comparison, a high density development as proposed, as proposed by the developers will likely look similar to what is seen here, located near Quality Foods on Lerwick. This is a photo of one of High Street Ventures' high density multi story apartment buildings. Sparse vegetation was planted, and electrical boxes have been wrapped to look like shrubs. On page 46 of the Town of Comox current official community plan from bylaw 1685, under the subheading 218 Trails, Parks, and Open Space, a direct quote states. Parks are an essential component of the urban landscape and serve a wide variety of functions. Mr. Olmsted, who was responsible for many of North America's first urban parks, advocated bringing nature into the city as a means to improve public health. Further down, further down the page, the OCP then states, Comox has a reputation for its character and beautiful natural surroundings. There is a strong support for a comprehensive park system that provides a variety of recreational opportunities and improve community health and well-being for all citizens, as well as environmental purposes. Here we have a 14 hectare clean canvas of undeveloped land perfectly situated against adjacent to already established greenways and beautiful and beautiful rural roads, perfect for walking, walking and cycling, with intact forests and wetlands along the north and east sides, helping moderate the local climate as well as being ideally set near shopping and services, all just a walk, cycle, or bus ride away. With the current combined proposal of over a thousand plus residential units on Hector and Aspen properties alone, this vision of a beautiful and unique development is near impossible for the size of these properties. And this number of units is not required to meet the 2025 projected household growth when you observe the numbers reported in the Town of Comox Housing Needs Report. Posted by the Town of Comox, posted on the Town of Comox webpage for public viewing as recently completed. With 406 units proposed for developments on Comox Ave, Port Augusta Street, and Guthrie Road, that would leave 334 units needed in the Aspen and Hector area to reach the target goal of 740 more households by 2025. Also, a recent letter written by Broad Street Properties on May 3rd, 2023, referencing a road study completed by McElhaney in 2018, stated that a full build-out of the Aspen and Hector properties would be approximately 548 units. Aspen, south of Guthrie, was meant to be the main roadway designated to carry the additional development traffic, and the intersection at Aspen and Guthrie would still be suitable without any inter intersection upgrades. If we do the math, 548 units in 14 hectares equals approximately 39 units per hectare. Based on 39 units per hectare for high street properties, this would mean 198 units rather than 520 for 941 Aspen, 158 units rather than 294 for 2000 for 2077 hectare, and Broad Street's 192 units is on par with the 39 units per hectare for 2123 hectare. Shown here are the combined site plans proposed by High Street Ventures and Broad Street Properties during their open houses last March, showing a build out of 1,000 units. What stood out to many who attended was a lack of green space replaced by parking lots and engineered features. As well, High Street and Broad Street buildings and parking lots border their rural residential neighbors you can imagine why adjacent residents were devastated by this proposal. Next, Julie, please. Thank you. Our design, as seen here and prepared by residents of Aspen and Hector Roads, is far more considerate to its neighbors, wildlife, and environment. In this site plan, all adjacent neighbors are buffered by trails and green space. As well, you'll see both paved wheelchair accessible trails and nature trails linking the current greenway system as well as the possibility of a scenic boardwalk around ecologically sensitive lands. This wetland, this site plan shows the shifting of buildings to more impacted areas where gravel pits and less desirable, desirable brush exist. This could be an amazing project and a leader in habitat and sensitive ecosystem retention. Because of the ecological value and rural lifestyle here, these properties are not only suitable, are not suitable 
for high density development in the way either developer is proposing, high density units would make sense if it retained more breathing space in other areas of the property. In conclusion, we hope that the Town of Comox and the developers will consider our following recommendations for subject properties. Create and retain greenway and nature trails. Protect sensitive ecosystems. Place greenways and nature trails as buffers between rural properties and new development. Keep CBRD portions of Hector and Aspen Road as dead ends. Hector through to Aspen would remain a greenway. Aspen through to Indians, emergency access only. Keep shorter buildings adjacent to rural neighbors, increase height towards the center of properties, and encourage town council members, the planning department, and, and developers to walk the neighborhood. Thank you. That was a perfect 10 minutes. Thank you, Jamie. And council does have a copy of that presentation also. So questions for Council Grant. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. That was a, a good presentation. I have to say that um, since I heard that there was going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand units going to that neighbor, I have struggled with that density in my mind since I heard the number. And so um, I'm not sure because we haven't, or I haven't really seen a proper look at plan yet as to what it actually looks like. But I do have to say that. I do struggle with that. Maybe it's all in there. So um, we'll see where it goes as we move through the system. But um, that's in my mind for sure. Uh, Councillor Mayor and then Councillor Blacklock, please. I just wanted to thank you for, for coming and to all the neighborhood folks who contributed, I'm sure, to the, the design. It's uh, really great to have such a productive. Um, kind of vision of, of what could happen there. So thank you. You uh, propose an alternate site plan for the property. Did you work out what the density per hectare was on that um, hypothetical site? We did. So what was it? It was 39, approximately 39 units okay. per hectare. And you mentioned that the existing Broad Street proposal was 39 units per hectare. That's correct. So it would be acceptable then for the neighborhood to have 31 units per hectare on the entire site? Yes, but the caveat is is where they place them because there is that red list of community on the property. And, you know, with looking at the different potential for paths and trails. So when um, it, the slide isn't up, but we sat down, we looked at it. We had somebody who knew a little bit about AutoCAD. It's not perfect, of course, because we're not, we're not the planning team, but uh, we did our best to try to fit everything in to kind of show that. Well, I've certainly as a resident of Comox since 1979, I've spent a lot of time in that area. Yeah. I never knew I was trespassing, but I could say <laughs> um, and, and I understand you know, the, the, the character and form of that neighborhood have historically been rural. Yeah. But I would also note that the original growth strategy that completes this old pen uh, clearly identifies all areas north of um, Guthrie heading all the way up to Rocky Road as a seven year expansion area appropriate for higher density. As we look, you know, people aren't going to start stop moving here. They really are. So we need to, we need to have places to put them. And I understand, like Ken, my own concerns, excuse me, also that with the density. But I think we do need to recognize that we can't we can't close the doors to this community. Uh, people will come whether we want them to. Not so far. Thanks, Mary. I have a question, perhaps uh, direct who you see fit, perhaps the chief planner. Um, so, what happens in a process like this? We have two developers uh, come with with their their designs and a certain number of units and a, and a site plan. Um, and then we have some community input with uh, a, an alternative site plan, you know, not fully flushed out, but with some changes to the geography um, of where buildings are going to save some of the, the green space. Um, has this happened before in Comox or maybe in other neighboring municipalities? And is there a process by which, I know we have formal processes and, you know, you know, public hearings and such, but is there a process by which community members and developers can sit down and work out something that everyone can be happy with. Thanks. So 
uh, over to CAO Wall, who's online, or we can go through to planning um, for Councillor yeah. first question. Yeah, maybe we'll we'll pass it over to Director Commence. Thanks, yeah. Well, over to planning, Director Commence. Um, provincial statutes uh, state that people have a legal right to apply for re to apply for rezoning and also a legal right to apply for those of um, Municipalities have to establish their procedures their procedure by law. Um, we do have that in our procedures by law. Uh, that is outlined through pre application consultation. Once an application is submitted, um, council has the ability to um, require a uh, town led open house to provide more information. Um, and then the matters, the bylaw still proceeds. Uh, that said, there's nothing stopping an applicant if they wish to from having further comments. And and uh, deliberations with interest groups or neighbors uh, and modifying their application. At this point, we do have an application before us. Thank you, Director Clemens, for that answer. Councillor Swift. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. I'm just wondering if you shared your uh, vision with the developers. I was first going to present here, and then usually, usually they contact me. Um, so yeah, I will be sending my if well, whether they ask or not, I'll send my presentation and my slides to them for sure. Okay, that looks like all the questions. Thank you for the thoughtful presentation and just seeing kind of some of the concerns from residents on the greenway, the wetland traffic type of buildings. I know from our discussions at council being residents in, in the community, those are pretty much bang on exactly what you know our flagged concerns are also. So it's nice to have those presentations and, and continue to have those thoughts on where we go from there. So we will be looking at the OCFP amendment later on this evening. So thank you, Julie. Thank you. So we'll now have Paul White and Jenny Steele from the Comox Golf Course, give information about the Comox Golf Club. Hi. Welcome to Jenny and Paul. Am I on? Hello. You um, are on. It's yeah. just going to be me. It's Paul Johnson. Welcome, Jenny. <laughs> We've only got 10 minutes, so we got to keep it. Uh, I'm Jenny Steele. I'm the finance director of the Golf Club. Uh, I, Paul is our, our president, Harvey is our board, and we have Jack Monson here tonight. He's the president of Cotton Golf Club. Our original plan was to invite you all to the golf club to so get to know you and meet and greet, given that you're a kind of landlord. Um, but then, after we saw the presentations uh, a month ago from Mr. Kippers and the BIA, we thought we'd come here in person and invite you to the golf course and maybe correct some things that might have been left in your mind. Um, so, I should, I should be talking to you. To you. Okay. So, just to uh, correct a few things, uh, a few things that Mr. Jacques didn't mention that we think would be major obstacles in his plan to turn the golf club into a multi-use park. First, the town is not on title as the owner of the land. It's owned by Cotton Golf Club Limited, CGCL. While the town is a majority shareholder in that company, the remaining shares are owned by public shareholders, all likely as a daughter's the 1966 share agreement from Mr. R.J. Soder to you provide, prohibits you from ever dissolving CGCL, nor are you allowed to sell off your shares. You must remain a majority holder. You are then joined at the hip with CGCL in perpetuity, thanks to Mr. Soder. Second, Mr. Philberg made his intention very clear at the time he transferred his shares. In his 1966 letter, he states, by agreement with the village, the area comprising the golf course must remain a golf course for the next 99 years, which would take you to 2065. I did the math. After 99 years, if it is no longer practical to retain the area as a golf course, it must become only a public park 
in perpetuity. Only if the golf course cannot be run as a golf course could it become a public park. I'd like to assure you that as three you can work golf clubs do intend to be viable for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Finally, the restrictive covenant on title requires the existing landscape in its character and form must be retained. Suggestions for tennis courts, pickleball courts, or bellow tracks would most certainly run afoul of the covenant. The only choice would be to revert to natural property. It would then fall to CGCL, with you as made the shareholder, to maintain it and to demolish the current buildings and infrastructure. Our club, the Comox Golf Club, uh, has existed since 1934. We were incorporated as a non profit in 48. Our current lease terminates in 2033. We pay all costs incurred by CGCL, such as legal fees and insurance. Our buildings are assessed at close to $1 million, and our books show net capital assets of over 600000 The cost, golf course has never been a financial burden to the town. Contrary to Mr. Jacquet's claim, we have paid considerable property taxes every year. Over the last five years alone, more than $83,000. The only permissible tax exemption to date has been on your share of the land, <laughs> uh, worth about $8,000 a year. So let's talk about our club. Um, we developed our vision, our mission, and core values about three years ago, and they're there for you to read. We use them to guide what we do. Our green fees and membership rates are the lowest in the region. Our kitchen offers a reasonably priced food for members of the public. We are uh, we're within walking distance of downtown and many retirement communities. We employ three salaried staff and up to 20 hourly staff. According to Staff Town, there are 1.5 million golfers in Canada. And according to the Canadian Fitness and Lifestyle Research Institute, golf is the second most popular sport in Canada, likely because it's played by all age groups. As you can see in the slide, we're increasing. The number of rounds played each year is growing. More than 35,000 nine-hole rounds were played last year, of which 13,000 around more than a third were green fields for the public. We're not just a member on the floor. We expect actually public revenue to exceed member revenue this year. Everybody's welcome to play in our leagues and our tournaments. We host other clubs and participate in zone and provision golfing events. 64% of this year's members are Comox residents. With more than 200 sub public players registered in our online booking system. And that's just as much. We just opened it up to the public in March. There's also volumes who are here. We have many senior members, several of whom walk the course from home. We have an 88-year-old who walks the course in the winter and has a 21.3 handicap. But all great. Nine whole courses are a trend right now. We have lots of younger and working people just don't want to spend five hours Play an 18 on a full length bus, on a, an 18 volt bus. Our driving range is popular and our juniors program is growing. So we have lots of action. Financially, we've got challenges. Um, inflation and COVID have, as everybody, presented challenges. We saw large increases in between 20 and 21 in our core expenses. Salaries and wages are maintenance and costs. Fuel and fertilizer costs went through the roof, and administration costs such as insurance and utilities went up. Our core revenue also dropped slightly in 21, which didn't help. In addition, in 21, we insourced our restaurant from the private sector. So we're totally, there's no, there's no business in one of our We did uh, experience some startup losses, but we think we turned the corner now. But 2023 is challenging. All of our money goes into basically operating and maintenance expenses, and we're left with little for things like factories and irrigation and, and, and things that wear out. So, what do we do? 
in the short term. Uh, we're trying to pull in as much revenue as we can uh, in, into our core business. Three, three things in one show. We've increased our advertising, revised our green fee structure, and allowed better online access to keep on booking to the public. As a result, golfing revenue for May is up 59% compared to this time last year, and is 45% more than we thought. So we think it's turn on the corner of the operation. It could be because of the weather, but we hope not. We're also pursuing diversification in the form of disc golf in non peak times in the golf world through a partnership with the Disc Golf Association. Secondly, we're putting together a business plan. This plan will be presented to our members and we'll give them the opportunity to see where we're at and what we as a board recommended that we're forward. Assuming our members approve, then we will be approaching financial institutions for Alliance Coder to help us better whether the future values are going to develop for us. We also intend to refinance our mortgage to address some of our capital requirements. The business plan will help support both these cases. However, to borrow from these institutions, we need the lease extended for further 30 years. So here's a, the focuses of our business plan, our pillars. We're going to improve the cost utilization for the new membership types, things like offering winter memberships to, to snowbirds who come here from the rest of Canada. For example, increasing tea time availability, loyalty cards, etc. We are looking at new revenue streams such as disc golf, expanded sponsor advertising. Thanks to your uh, CFO Clyde, who I met with a couple of months ago, we just put in for a BC gaming branch brand, brand for a new track. It is on track. Uh, we'd like to pursue a capital gaming brand for our irrigation system, but for that we must match funds, and we can only do that. If we want it. And to do that, we need a lease. Maybe there are other grants that you, as a municipality, have access to to help us out with. We're looking at ways to reduce costs too. So, looking at trying to reduce our insurance, our property tax, looking at kitchen hours. We're looking across the board uh, at ways to reduce, reduce costs. And of course, we've got to look at cost improvements. We've got to keep our costs in good shape. We don't want it to be a cow pasture. That wouldn't be good for the town at all. It wouldn't be good for us. But we really have to address things like our irrigation system. We've got to upgrade the electric power cuts, clubhouse upgrades. So, our next steps. In June, as I say, we'll finalize our plan and present to our membership. But then we'd really like to for you guys to come over and have a visit in July. Uh, we'll host you, play nine holes, uh, treat you to our chef Charles' it's good stuff, and um, and maybe get to know each other a bit better. And we'll see what a real gem of a course we have here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jenny, for that business plan update and invitation to council. I know many of us have golfed there before and been to the restaurant, but it's nice to have a formal invitation. I just have a quick question. So the lease renewal would be requested for 2033 to 2063? Yeah, if we remortgage right now, it's to 2033. Um, and if we remortgage, we've got to go like 25 years. Right. So we've got to go at least to 2050. Okay, so around 2050. And is it a line of credit and a mortgage that you're doing? Or well, we're going, to look at, we're going to try and get both. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't have a line of credit right now, and it's always been nice to have that in the bag in case, you know, just in case you get three months of rain. Mm -hmm. Things don't, don't go that well. So, yeah. A lot of seasonality to go. Okay, questions from council. We have Councillor Blackwell. It's my understanding that most golf clubs run with the CPTA Class A professional and co shop who would then provide uh, the on a fleet lease basis electric power carts for use by the membership in public. Is that a uh, route the Coma Golf Club is looking at going? No, in fact, it's for me to retain the weight on. We used to, I mean, we're not even of course. So I've only been there two years, and many of my colleagues can so, um, From what my understanding is, we used to kind of outsource. The whole coal shop, and as you say, the, the golf cart was to the club, and that was a business. And, and that's why we didn't think it was a public tax because mm -hmm. it was a business. So, no, at this point, we're not, we're not looking at doing that. Okay. Yeah, we've been, you know, quite steady. Mm -hmm.
the other the other issue with power plants, oh my, is you don't have the, the electrical infrastructure, you need 30,000 to upgrade your 30,000 people, you know, maybe potential game then come come in these issues. Council Mayor. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's so wonderful to learn more about the history mm -hmm. of, of this this land and of um, your organization. Um, I'm curious about if you're talking a lot about water use and water consumption, just given our, our drought conditions, and I know that comes up for some golf courses. Um, we do have our own wells on the property. We don't we don't run on city water. Um, and I believe that a new well was put in two three years ago, maybe. Except we need a better education. <laughs> Keeps breaking down. Paul, do you mind just going to the mic? If um, I'm just going to for those online, make sure we capture some of these answers and comments, please. I'm Paul White, the president, currently the president of the Comox Golf Course. I just simply wanted to point out to those that might not be familiar with golf players that uh, there is a big retaining pond that's been on the property for as long. I've been a member for 30 years. Uh, it's collected a lot of my balls over the years. So, uh, um, But that's what we're using for our water. Um, that's why we also, like you said, we were having some issues with our irrigation. We also wanted to get that second up here. Thanks for that addition, Paul. Uh, Councillor Hasler. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, as someone who is a junior and still continues to fight the courts, I really appreciate the, uh, the services that are provided there. I think the, it's a great part of the community. Um, you have some projected numbers um, already, uh, like we do some really, really nice weather. Um, has that changed what you guys have projected for your rounds for this year? Um, we're seeing, like, I keep track of them, yeah, we're going to have more rounds this year. Like, in May, compared to May, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but compared to May, but year to date, from one year to the other, yeah, we've got more this year. It's going up still. A lot of that, I think, is maybe due to the fact that we open the coupon system to the public, <laughs> and it, uh, you know, we have, you know, but um, um, the rates going right now. Um, and we'll keep going that way. Thanks very much. Councillor Carl. Thanks for the presentation. My, my, I have a quick disclaimer. I should say my son is one of your junior members, so uh, yeah. so thanks for all the the information he gets. Um, and yes, uh, I've had a few balls on the on the number three myself. A few too many. Um, quick question about the, the uh, agreements. I'm just trying to understand this better because there's the Agreement between Mr. Philberg and the town in 1966, which 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 states, um, uh, you know, it can be used as a golf course as it is now or a public park. And then there's a letter that's separate. That's right. that separate. was written at the same time. That was written at the same time, but not. I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, maybe I'd like to hear your opinion, but also maybe from staff whether the letter of its intent is legally binding. Um, because it, it is a it is a letter in addition to a legally binding document between or agreement between the town and um, and Mr. Gilbert. So I'd just like to understand clearly what the rules are and um, like to your opinion, maybe if the town staff is. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know, maybe Jack can, can, can correct me if I'm facing you wrong. Um, but my understanding is that that was his intent to go into the agreement. But it was awkward to put it in saying, you know, this or that. And then, so, so they just said in perpetuity to both of them. To, to both, you know, um, both cost first and then public part. But, but again, I mean, one of the issues is, is that we, it's not municipal land, it's owned by a private company. <laughs> and then, um, you'd have to get all of the men, um, tackle that issue before you. Possibly to do some. But again, the agreement quite, quite clearly states that you cannot sell your shares and you can't get out of the CPCL. You're not allowed to dissolve the company. 
uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure your legal people can go through it. We attached all those documents to, to the submission, to this delegation. So I think they have everything. Yeah, we have copies of everything and we can go over to staff. My understanding is we would, there'd, there'd be need to be more legal on that. But CAO Wall, do you have any comment on that? or? Uh, not, not other than that, we'll need to get a legal review and legal opinion to come back. Um, council, as the majority shareholder in this uh, company or corporation, your immediate sort of uh, nexus of control to affect this is appointing the board of directors. And so that is how you would um, form direction within the company would be to appoint a board of directors that would be willing to carry out uh, your vision for the use of the land. So. Uh, we'll need to get a legal opinion on whether or not the uh, use could be changed now, given the letter that we have from Mr. Filberg, but your ability to control what happens there wouldn't be through direct motions at council. It would be through the appointment of, an, of a uh, board of directors. Thank you, CEO Wall, and there's no direction from council at this time for that discussion. And any further questions for Jenny? Okay, thank you so much for coming and okay, sharing the you. updates. I hope to see you all in July. Yeah. Look forward to the invite. Thank you. So we'll just give a moment for anyone who wants to uh, depart before we start the regular portion of the meeting. It'll be, thanks for coming. Thank you. It'll just be about a 30 second break, not very, not very long. Okay, so going back to the regular uh, council meeting. If I can get an adoption of the minutes for the regular council meeting of May 17th, 2023, Senator. All those in favor? That's approved. For the consent agenda, we have nine items, A through, not, A through I, which we will move as a lot. And then you're welcome to pull out any individual items. Can I get a motion for approving? And a seconder. All those approved. All those in favor. Approved. Okay, so consent agenda items to be discussed. Councillor Hazlitt. Uh, can I pull up C, please? Yeah, C. So that was for, thank you, seconder. Jennifer Knox, Desolation Sound Yacht Charters, May 24th, concerned with a lack of service at the marina, which is in regards to the gas and go fuel for marine. So I understand that one of the one of the issues that they were having was the lack of being able to get diesel at the dock. Um, is this and maybe this is over to staff, but is this something that uh, is currently being provided? If not, will it be provided? And is there a timeline for where us to be able to buy diesel in the dock? The fact that we're getting into the middle of summer, we're getting more and more people to uh, Yes, we can go over to. I think it was a. Quality maintenance and pricing challenge. Uh, over to CAO Wall. Could you hear Councillor Hazlitt's question okay? I, I think so. I think he was asking around the timelines for resumption of fuel provision. Correct. Uh, I, I do know that, that they're diesel. diesel provision. Yeah, I do know that they're working um, already to do the needed repairs in order to continue um, and resume uh, providing that service. I don't have a timeline on when that is, but I can find out from Council and uh, get. Get that back to you. Thank you for that. Council has it. Does that work? Yeah. Perfect. There's a lot going on down there with the gas and go updates. Uh, other items to be pulled? Mm -hmm. Councillor Kerr and then Councillor Mayor. Uh, item A, if you get a second. Uh, so item A uh, it speaks to the uh, Cumberland effort. Keep talking about Cumberland tonight. Um, their efforts, they had a couple of online meetings in May and an online survey to talk about uh, thoughts around tree protection in the village. Uh, I spoke with Councillor Kettler uh, from Cumberland and they haven't received a copy kind of, of all the summary from the feedback from the public. But I was wondering if we could request that staff uh, uh, ask for a copy from Cumberland just to kind of see what general thoughts are. I know it's a different community and they might have different thoughts here, but it might be useful for us to help inform our own like OCP renewal process, whether we want to do something similar here with a 
town hall around tree protection and maybe might even help shape our thoughts around developing our own tree bylaw. So I guess my request is could we ask staff to ask for that report and when it's ready. Yeah, I had noted similar thoughts that we could follow up with either Mayor Brown or the communications department. I think the last one was right around this week. It was very current. So over to CAO Wall, are we okay to not have a motion or would a motion be preferred to get a copy of their community consultation? Uh, this is just an information request. So with the direction from your worship, we will uh, execute it. Okay, yeah. Uh, through Councillor Kerr's recommendation and um, everyone's giving a bit of a nod of a head, we'll just follow up and find out what their community engagement looks like around that tree protection since they've done the work just to see where they're at with that. Thank you for that. Thanks, CEO Wall. And then we have Council Mayor. Thanks. I wanted to pull out uh, F and H. Uh, if we could just pull out one item and get a second one, that would be great. Sure. Let's start with F. Uh, can I get a second one? Perfect. So that's on Burrito Prado, Comox Valley Food Policy Council's letter encouraging the town of Comox to include local food procurement as a part of its social procurement policy. Yeah. Um, so I just you know, wanted to say thanks to the food policy council members who put this together. It was a, a lot of volunteer hours um, to kind of research. And I think it's a really great letter. And I also just wanted to note kind of the untapped economic development opportunity we have by supporting local food. Um, I think the food policy council is going to come and present. So I wanted to also get a sense of if there were like kind of outstanding questions, any specific questions. Um, as the rep on the Food Policy Council, I can take that back and, and make sure that that presentation kind of answers those. You want to open that up? Yeah. Councillor Swift, for a question on that. Uh, thank you. And maybe you can help me with this because um, while I don't have a problem with the idea, I'm just wondering what it would pertain to because I know uh, signing in, in the letter to Shellfish for the Seafood Festival. That is an hour of want, and uh, it's not even taking place in Comox. So, um, so if that one aside, but going forward, what would it pertain to? Yeah, so it might make a little bit more sense once we have the draft social procurement policy from staff, but essentially, the idea is that anytime we're doing RFQs or if we're buying things, what this is is guidance that says we would privilege local first, essentially. So for our institution, probably the impact is small, but not insignificant because we don't, like, we're not a big food purchaser. Um, but I think every little bit helps, and it does help in terms of showing leadership for that um, kind of privileging local. Yeah, I I I understand that, but uh, what I guess what I'm thinking about is something like logical ways would we require the food vendors there to uh, be sourcing their products locally and so. So I think what the Food Policy Council is suggesting, uh, or what would be suggested, would be that staff would work with the Food Policy Council to understand what would make sense in terms of how it would come into our own social procurement policy. So, so at a staff level, they would work through those details. What we wouldn't want to do is make it like, kind of impossible for for anybody to then continue to do their business. It's that's not sort of what we would want to do with it. Yeah. That's great guidance for the presentation to maybe get a little bit more specific with how it can make a difference and how it can be used. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that's great knowing how many layers it goes down and affects other suppliers in the community would be a great main question. And the second item you were pulling was Yeah, I just wanted to talk about each seconder. That's the one about it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for. Um, so I just appreciated this letter so much, uh, coming, coming from uh, youth and talking about reconciliation. And this was maybe a bit more of a question for staff because it's specifically asking about uh, an, uh, like an undrip implementation plan. And the, the only uh, 
local government that I know who has done well is the city of Vancouver. Um, but what I wonder is uh, if there have been conversations with staff. I know there's a little bit of a reconciliation staff level working group. So this is maybe a question for CA Wall. Um, if if there have been discussions about anything like this. So, so we've, just, yeah. yeah, thank you uh, through your worship to uh, Councillor Mayor. So we have made a, um, we've done a number of actions, one to try and build internal capacity to understand um, UNDRIP and how to implement it and consider it in our everyday actions. So last year we completed um, Indigenous relations training um, and understanding for working with our Indigenous partners for every exam exempt management staff member. So that was one of the first items that we complete or one of the items we completed last year to ensure that um, each of our actions, we are considering that as we move forward. Uh, uh, one of the other things that we are doing is trying to consult with KFN in a manner that allows them to allows them to use our internal resources to further what it is that they require. So for example, rather than just reaching out to KFN and asking them if they want to be involved in a project, um, having suggestions on how they could be involved in a project or what we can be doing in this project to help bring benefit to their nation as well. And so uh, through that way, we're trying to engage and bring benefit to um, our, our KFN partners. Uh, further, I am involved in a regional uh, process that is bringing Indigenous uh, communities uh, and relations across the island to try and have a singular group that can report back out on how we can do this engagement further. So uh, I think we're taking a number of actions, but nothing to the level of, you know, a, a, a um, you know, a report or a list that highlights how we're implementing each individual call to action. Thank you, CEO Wall, for that. And I agree, it's nice to see you threading in on those things that my thought was, well, we may not have a specific policy. I can give some examples of like the Water Guardians program we supported and some of the kind of things that have come up in the last couple of years and just share that and you know encourage that type of communication to the council coming from you. So that informally we'll watch the letter that goes back to Rory and thank you for submitting that. Other items to float? I'd like to pull out I for the National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. Thank you. So again, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that the, the event is happening. They changed the location. I don't know where it is, but not the exact. Down to the Puntledge RV campground, and it is open to the public from 3.30 to 7. Uh, they're doing drumming, singing, fashion show, live artists, traditional dancing. Um, it's very family friendly. Um, they've got a lot of artists featured, and uh, as elected officials, we've been invited down for a 9 a.m. until 3.30 session, which includes lunch and learning sessions, so I encourage everyone to uh, consider attending if you're free. It is on Wednesday, June 21st, and we were asked to RSVP to former Councillor Kat Frank by Friday, June 9th, so that's coming up this week, so just wanted to quickly pull that out and encourage everyone to go down to the event that looks like it's going to be a bit uh, bigger and broader and in a new location. Thank you for that. So um, it's unfortunate that they're doing it on a Wednesday during the day because uh, I won't be able to make it this time. And I think there's probably others here that you know you can't take a whole day off for or something like that. So I would encourage you if they're going to do this to do it on a different day rather than a weekday so that those of us with jobs that we have to go to could yeah. I think the it's a national day, so I think the Commons First Nation is likely following the national day. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, other items to be pulled out from the consent agenda. Perfect. So moving along. Moving on to unfinished business, we have the Comox Skate Park and Pump Track updates from page 36. The Council received the June 7, 2023 report to Mayor and Council titled Comox Skate Park and Pump Track Update for Information. And get a seconder. And so again, that report was uh, just for information. There is an alternate recommendation. Any questions on the report that we're receiving? All in favor of the recommendation to receive the report tonight? 
Perfect. That passes unanimously. Thank you to Rack Creation for providing that. The big agenda is the big in the case. In your own case. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have part B, which is the Comox Skate Park and Pump Track Engagement Plan. There are, that's on page 80 now, and there are three recommendations uh, from staff, and I'm just going to quickly read those out before we talk about it. Recommendation one is that council endorse the Skate Park and Pump Track Community Engagement Plan in the June 7th report, titled Comox Skate Park and Pump Track Community Engagement Plan. Recommendation two is that council endorse using the Comox Valley Regional Districts Engage Comox Valley Community Engagement Platform as a communications and community outreach tactic to get public input. And the third recommendation is that council accept the Skate Park and Pump Track Advisory Committee SBTC SBTAC terms of reference. So would you like to move them all together or one at a time? I know I always want to do them together. You always want to do them one at a time. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. Just in case there's any discussion. <laughs> okay, so discussion around recommendation number one. Uh, Councillor Swift. Thank you. Um, I'm, I fully support all of these uh, uh, recommendations, uh, but I think we, it's, we had agreed that this is going to be grant dependent. And I think that's a really important message to get out there in the community while we're having these discussions because it's very frustrating to be part of a, a, a group and engage and then nothing happens. So um, I'd like that to be really clearly stated at some point in these um, meetings. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing to share. Now, I know there was some budget set aside. This is going back two or three years ago when we first came out. So I think it's partial grant funding, and maybe that's where we get really clear with how much is, how much isn't, and we've had new provincial funds since, so we're not sure where the funding is coming from yet. Is that uh, Council Grant? No, I'm sorry. Council Mayor. It's actually on the third motion, so process-wise, is basically, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay, so any other questions on Recommendation one, CAO Wall. Thank you for noting that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Minions. I just wanted to note, Council, that I think it is worth maybe making an amendment to this motion to request that we put in the terms of reference the fact that these projects are going to be grant dependent. I think that'll make it clear and help um, the community understand the work that they're doing so they don't think that it's going to be actioned right away. So if, if Council wants to consider that as a grant dependent project, uh, I'd suggest you uh, make that motion to amend the terms of reference and we can include it in there directly. That would make sense on recommendation three and we may want to have a little discussion because I don't know we've ever actually made that full motion but it's definitely grant dependent so that might take a little bit of conversation around. So we will hold that for part three of the recommendation it sounds like and so right now we would be looking at passing the community engagement plan, which would go hand in hand with the terms of reference, but not part of the amendment. Uh, Councillor Kerr on recommendation one. My, my only question is, it's, it's kind of in one and three, but it's just, we, we're asking for one youth member. And I, I wonder if we might want to increase that, um, specifically uh, with school and sports and such. Uh, youth may have more trouble making meeting times and so maybe having a, a collection of i don't know what the right number is pick a number three or four more than one youth so if one can't make it then at least there's a youth voice at the table uh, I, I suspect many of the community members we invite who are adults can attend and we'll put it in their pay books and, and on their phones and be there but the youth it's attended that these things can be a little more sporadic so we might want to have more numbers Okay. It sounds like it was Council Mayor's thoughts also, so we will possibly hold it till number three. Thank you. So on recommendation one, any further questions? All those in favor? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Number two is that Council endorsed using the CBRD's platform uh, Engage, which has been out, I think, for a couple months now. I'm not sure who's had a chance, but it looks pretty user-friendly and easily accessible. Thank you. 
Uh, questions? It's going to be a jar. Questions on number two, Councillor Hazlitt? Um, this looks like a really good platform, um, especially since it's no cost. Um, <laughs> Be, it's going to be really, really good for community feedback. Um, the one big question I have around it is: um, Is there any good track where the or where the feedback is coming from based on communities? My understanding is there is, but that might be a good question over to CAO Wall and possibly CAO Wall to Director of Recreation. But um, it would be good to know where where the location geographically of this. CAO wall or over to? Yeah, I'll pass that over to Director Hagner, um, Director Hagner or our uh, manager of communications may be able to answer that. Over to Director Hagner. Director to council. Yes, um, this platform, um, through all the surveying you can do on it and the tools that are there, you can request where the um, comment is coming from, and if you want to kind of add in, uh, this is only for um, input by citizens of the town of Comox, it could be that. Once again, in the report, I note that it's important that when we do kind of hear feedback, that there will be input from others that may help develop um, design and, and feedback that could become very valuable to the council. So sometimes opening up the conversation actually helps, but it definitely can track the area in which they're coming from. Thank you for that, Councillor Kirk. I just wanted to say for the record that I'm so excited about the community online engagement process, and I'll be raising both hands uh, to vote for this. Uh, just a quick question to staff. This doesn't see anything in there that really pinholes us into the location out of the two that have had, obviously, the geotech. But if something different comes up in the future, this is not making any firm decisions on location at this stage of, of approving these recommendations. Is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Just one that was my main, main concern as things continue to evolve and change in, in the community. Okay, so we're on number two. It sounds like everyone is quite in, I shouldn't say that, but we will vote on number two. All those in favor? Perfect, opposed? That passes, thank you very much. And the third is that council accepts State Park and Pump Track Advisory Committee, SPT TAC, SP -TAC terms of reference. Sorry, one youth and an alternate. Or two. <laughs> uh, Kate, we'll get a seconder for the motion with the amendment as added. So again, we're saying that it's grant dependent to make that clear and adding one youth and an alternate youth. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So thank you. Do you need to, so CAO Wall and then possibly. Thank you. I just wanted to get clarification from Council if you're looking to add um, two voting members of youth or if you're looking to add one voting member of youth with the ability for them to have alternates attend. And, and I think we would we would allow alternates to be attending from any of the specific user groups that are there. So just looking for clarification. My intent was one vote with an alternate in case they couldn't take me. Okay, maybe I'll ask um, Director Hagmere if if you feel that the terms of reference as they are would allow for uh, alternates to attend in the place of somebody if they can't make the meeting. Over to Director Hagmere. I think, uh, through your worship, I think it would be helpful to have language added to the uh, terms of reference that all this can uh, are available for any of the community members and clarifying the voting privileges for them as well. Thank you for that clarification. Councillor Kerr and then Councillor Mayor. So there's eight, eight members on the committee. There's going to be seven adults and one youth. I mean, 
you know, I like meetings, I like committees, but, you know, for a youth to come on and be a part of that process and kind of be the lone youth voice. I mean, this all came from a youth engagement survey, um, youth recreation survey. And so I think having a more of a youth presence on this this committee would be reasonable. So um, I'm curious what the rest of council thinks maybe just naming two members, having nine people uh, on the committee and including two youth, hopefully both can attend as many meetings as possible. Any support that? Other comments? And we'll figure out procedural after. Councilor Mayor. Yeah, um, I was uh, speaking with a, a community member who uh, is an expert in youth engagement, and um, they suggested that we look to include the youth council that is being run through RAP um, potentially to see if there was any, a way to engage. Uh, with them or, or kind of use that existing group in some kind of advisory capacity. Um, so I wanted to put that forward um, as a potential opportunity, um, not only for this actually, but thinking about lots of opportunities uh, with, with that youth council um, to en engage them more in um, specific goings on. Um, and then I, I would absolutely be in favor of, of giving youth more than one vote, um, given that this is for them. Um, I think two, two is great. And what I was going to suggest for the terms of reference, um, what we've been finding on, on some other groups um, that I've been part of is just acknowledging, especially in a small community like this, that many of us wear many different hats. And so it might be more important that we have eight to 10 people who represent all of those views that are listed rather than necessarily have one representative, one representative for each of those views, if that makes sense. Um, so I wanted to kind of put that forward for staff consideration. Okay, so over to staff, the question will be how to involve youth council as a whole through RAC, and I'm not sure, but I'll pass it over to CAO Wall, but we could also look at having their council have one or two of the seats so that their whole voice gets recognized as those two votes are they from there, you know. Um, but over to CAO Wall, CAO Wall to answer Councilor Mayor's question on involving the youth council on the TAP. Thank you, Your Worship. I think that's a council decision on who you want to um, invite. If you're going to have the youth council um, occupying those seats, the choices will be made for who the representatives are from the youth council. And so there's going to be a number of pros to that. This is a group that's going to be more familiar with these type of processes, a group that's engaged um, in seeking, you know, community reform and community change. Uh, the con may be that the youth group uh, or the youth council may not have that level of expertise or usership in this type of uh, facility or desire to use that type of facility. So you may end up limiting who's applying. Ultimately, it's I think it's up to council to weigh the, the, the pros and cons of um, how you want to send that invitation out. So, well, we have Director Hagner uh, chip in. He has his hand raised, which... Take that as a yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry, um, go ahead. The CAO Wall makes a very good point about uh, the composition of, of the committee and where you want that, uh, where you want the consultation and that expertise to come from, which is a matter for council to decide. The youth council, though, will have a role in this process because this committee is designed to then go out to the community and to help validate and um, extend the engagement process that staff are creating right into the community themselves. And so when we looked at the people on the committee, we thought, well, who's going to help us reach out to this group of people over here and that group of people over there? And the youth council will be a part of that because we'll be able to get to a whole bunch of youth through that avenue, as well as having perhaps a particular um, pump track or skateboard user on the advisory committee. 
thanks for providing that uh, vote step there. So we have a motion on the floor that has the amendment um, to the terms of reference with one youth member and the grant funding contingent. I don't remember what the other one was there. Can we amend the amendment? Because I don't have any problem putting two, two uh, youth. Shall we find fine by me? But I think that also suggested that we uh, add alternates for each position rather than just the youth. So I would amend the motion to say two, two, two youth and to have an alternate for each position. If they want to. Okay, so three, three changes there. Is a friendly amendment on that okay? Just from one to two? Or should we defeat the motion and have a new motion? I guess, sorry, I can't hear the discussion. Are you looking for direction from me? I, I saw people that might have been speaking. We've had a couple of amendments to an amendment, so we're just wondering if we should vote on the amendment, strike it down, and then have a new motion. Was the amendment seconded already? Uh, it was, I would say, yes. Okay, it might be easier at, okay. right now to just vote on the amendment and then deal with the amended motion. Sure. So we're going to vote on the initial amendment, which is the one and does not have the alternates at this point. So all in favor of the amendment? Opposed? Thank you everyone for following that. <laughs> and if I can get a new motion, if anyone has a new motion that includes those three items. Yeah. Council Brown. So we will, can we add that this project will be grant dependent, that we put two views on the committee and that we put and that we allow for alternates on all the motions. Okay, second there. Second. Great discussion on the motion on the floor. Councillor Blacklock. To Councillor Mayor's point, I see what I see the the what sort of I think what you're trying to get across here is that if each person comes from a specific role, right, and they feel that they'll be there as just an advocate for that one group so if you if you're coming from the disc golf players for example your whole focus in the meeting will be how can i limit the potential impact to the existing disc golf disc golf course you know in potlock park so you, you that'll be your kind of mindset you so you you would vote against anything that you thought or the disc golf association thought would be um, not appropriately uh, designed to support disc golf and so i you know, I, I like having someone from each um, um, representative group, but just a reminder that to the staff person who's running is to make sure that the, the committee understands that the idea is to come to a, a majority resolution on the best way forward to get these things done with, uh, with some funding support. So that was my only comment rather than a question. Okay, so no further questions. All those in favor of number three with those three additions. Perfect, that passes. And thank you to Director Hegmeyer, Robbie, Kareen, and Andrew for the hard work on that to date. It's coming along with grant funding coming one day. So we're moving on to new business. Bylaw adoption. So, page 89, we have the Comox Street and Traffic Bylaw number, which is the snow clearing 1358.05-2023. And that Comox Street and Traffic Bylaw 1358.053-2023 be adopted. Perfect. All in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. We have Comox Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw number 2004. 2004.01-2023. The seconder. Questions? All those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we're on to new business. We have uh, page 92, bat friendly community certification. That the town of Comox proceed with an application to the BC Community Bat Program to become a certified bat friendly community as recommended in the June 7th report to Mayor and Council from the Parks Department titled Bat Friendly Community Certification. We heard earlier we would be the first on Vancouver Island and that the cost, of course, is in the bat boxes and the education that's been happening for a couple of years in Comox. 
and is being championed by Tim and uh, some of our staff locally. So there is a recommendation there or an alternate to the approach. And questions, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Perfect, that passes unanimously. And that's some good news there. And now we have on page 100, Development Variance Permit Application DBP 23-4 for the address at 183 Bay Court. That Development Variance, sorry, Development Variance Permit DBP 23-4 for the proposed garage addition as shown in Attachment 2 to the May 15th, 2023 Planning Report be issued subject to the Development Variance Permit conditions listed in Schedule 1. Any questions, comments? Councillor Blacklock. Just, uh, just want to clarify that this is the second DVP in a row, and I know they're not related, but it's come to us from a one of these corner lots. And I just want to specify, I just ask a question uh, to staff. Is, is, is the fact that these are all on corner lots creating a distinction between a front yard and a rear yard? Uh, is that what's leading to these, these applications? Like, the, it, it's my understanding the front yard for this is Bay Court, right? And this this is in the the, the, the uh, variance is asked for the rear yard setback. Um, if this had been on at one ninety five to connect the property to the north, would that would that flip around? Would that be uh, would that still be the year the the, the rear yard setback on one ninety five Bay Court? Would that still be maintained at seven and a half meter? Over to Sierra Wall. Yeah, through to uh, Director of Planning. Yes, um, the these are these two uh, variance applications are at eight years. The previous one um, essentially didn't have a corner on the exterior corner. So in this case, uh, 183, it's um, the north lot line of 182 is the rear, and on 195, the south lot line is. There is absolutely no difference on this one uh, between corner lots and the interior lots. Um, 190. 1935 and 1936. Thank you. I had only asked just because I know the, the address is up Bay Court, but then that's run to Judge Taylor on the south side. So we just, just for clarification that, that we are the rear yard is to the north. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I would speak in favor of, of this uh, DVP. Uh, I did have a look at the property and I would note that. It is lower than the existing house, the garage behind the house, and the, the, the house to the south. So there is minimal view impacts on the properties to the north. So I would speak in support of this application. Thanks for those comments. We have Councillor Hazlitt and then Councillor Kirk. Um, like Councillor Blacklock, I would um, speak in favor of this. Um, I know the house pretty well. My parents did the renovation on it. Uh, I lived there for about five years. So um, when you go into the garage, there's considerable drop from uh, footing. So I think the, uh, the new owners of the property, some of the park their vehicles uh, out of the weather, but we have we can support this. Uh, so we, we see some letters of support from the uh, the neighbors uh, across the road, and the the owners. Um, Mentioned that there are neighbor that would be mostly affected by this 195 Bay Court gave verbal approval. I, did we receive a official letter or support from that neighbor? I'm just wondering if if we have um, any, anything up, in addition to the owners stating that they have uh, verbal support. Not that I saw, but Councillor, sorry, CAO Wall. Um, if you heard Councillor Kerr there, he was asking about 195. The address closest to they gave verbal but no written submission. Is that accurate? Uh, through to uh, director of planning. Yes, that's correct. We do not have written submission for 195. Further questions on DBP 23 4. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. So we're moving on to page 113. We have the automatic garbage collection cart sizes, which have been brought to council meeting this evening for us. 
So in January, uh, approximately January 2024, we'll be switching over to the automatic uh, curbside collection and some uh, other changes. So staff has put together this report for us on what the recommendation is. And so I'm not going to read them all out, but there is the recommendation includes A through E, which goes through single family, single family with suite, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, as well as curbside multifamily per unit. And those are there. Uh, we've been asked for the last week or so to kind of consider, take a look and be able to provide meaningful input tonight because these bins are going to be ordered um, ASAP. So there is a recommendation from uh, CAO and staff there, and there is also alternate to the recommendations and then whatever other recommendations council would have. So questions, comments, or a moving of a motion? Councilor Grant. So I know that we're here just to talk about the size of the bins more than anything. Um, I'm, I'm having a lot of concern about how the rollout of this is going to work. Um, I think that it's going to be chaos, to be honest with you. Um, and you know, part part of the, you know, part of what I'm hearing out there in the community is that, well, why are we doing this? And, and so, I, I guess I have a question for the engineer, and one of them would be that my understanding is that Courtney and Cumberland both have signed on to this, and that Antara is actually changing their trucks to these automatic pickup trucks. And if we were to go independent, that it, the cost would be much greater than than what we're doing. At that. Is am I correct in that? Uh, we'll just go through the CAO wall and correct you. CAO wall is is it correct that if we did this on our own outside of Courtney Cumberland, based on I think in the process where we're at, it'd be much yeah. more expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would estimate that that would be the case. So I just want to make note though that Cumberland, although initially in this joint process did leave the process, they are not moving over to an automated collection system right now. So what Cumberland is going to be dependent on is the older MTERA trucks that are being decommissioned. Um, they're going to continue using them. Uh, but I, I do want to highlight that Cumberland and Comox are in very different situations. The number of units and households to be picked up are vastly different. So uh, if we were to not move to this automated pickup system, we would have to go out to an RFP and source our own trucks. And we would lose that sort of efficiency that we're going to get by having one provider with one set of vehicles to be able to do this. So yes, it would be much more expensive for Comox to do this on our own. Uh, Cumberland is not making a change right now, uh, but I, I do want to highlight that that wouldn't be an option for the town of, of Comox, given the, the level of service and number of unit uh, households that we need to have picked up on a daily basis. I, I think it's important that the public know why we're doing this, because I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of joy out there. In this. So um, my other question on this is, when you get into areas like Forrester and Butchers Road down there, where we have houses with suites, and parking along the street, and then a meter between each bin. I just can't see any way how that can work now. So I'm wondering if there's some plan for the rollout there, because that'll just be chaos in that neighborhood from what I can see. Yeah, over to staff, I'd say that was one of the biggest things we kind of learned in the last couple of weeks was the spacing between bins and just the logistics of it. So is there a special plan for some of the newer neighborhoods where um, the roadways are? Smaller for good reason. So, uh, Your Worship, one of the one of the reasons we brought this recommendation to you is for that reason is to try and to decrease the number of unit or decrease the number of bins we're going to have per unit, especially per units with suites, as well as decrease the size of um, some of the bins. I guess I say we we do recognize there's going to be um, street parking implications for this. That there's going to be a loss of street parking on garbage days and people. Um, you know, over time, people will develop systems to try and mitigate that for, you know, putting them out as they leave. But yeah, this is going to uh, impact street parking in those areas. Thank you for the comment. We will all just let it see. And then that's, uh, we'll go Councillor Swift, Councillor Blackwell, Councillor Hassett, Councillor Swift, please. Um, I have a couple of comments on the sizing, but um, thinking about this, uh, one of the things that occurred to me, is there any way of accommodating people that are uh, disabled or less able to 
drag those gigantic containers out to their driveway and picking up people with wheelchairs or um, elderly people that it's going to be really a challenge for them to manage. So are there any systems that you know of that have been developed to help those people? Yeah, uh, sorry, Your Worship, yes, we do. The um, contract requires the assisted set out provisions by MTERA. So people who are unable to physically bring their carts out uh, can apply to the program. And then the um, garbage truck driver would get out and bring the uh, bins to the curb for them. I do want to say that these bins, although they look larger uh, and maybe heavier, are, go are ergonomically designed to be able to be wheeled out. I think as people start to use them, they will find even though they're bigger, it's going to be much easier for them to actually transport them than what they're using right now. So I don't suspect anybody who is able to get their bins to the curb now will have any trouble or any more trouble getting these bins to the curb. And if they do, we have the assisted set out program that they can apply for. Great. Now, shall I carry on or shall I let somebody else? Okay. Um, <laughs> so the other one is the try and the quadplexes. If they're each going to get, even with a smaller town, that's a lot of uh, towns per unit. I was looking at development such as the Cypress Grove one that's um, you know, coming on stream on Anderton. And I don't know that a garbage truck would be able to get down there if all those towns are out. But anyway, I guess those are some of the bumps in the roads that we'll have to uh, work through. Um, but uh, getting back to the size of the cans, um, I was looking at it, and I'm going to speak on behalf of a single family of the suite because I do have some personal knowledge regarding that. But um, I'm looking at the single family of the suite, and the single family uh, up the bottom on the uh, paper is. 1, 120, 1 through 60, and 1 through 64 organics. And a single family with a suite still has those requirements. So I'm suggesting that a single family with a suite have that. And then um, the suite can have the two garbage, the 120, um, and actually have a smaller organics. So making it three of the 120s. And, um, but retain the 360 for the recycling and 360 for organics, and perhaps one 240 for recycling for the speed. So I don't think it's practical for a tenant in, in all cases in the unit. Uh, I don't think it's practical for a tenant and a, a single family a unit to be sharing one organics can. It's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, because you know, you're going to have to run up and down the stairs or in and out filming or however it goes. So if we want people to really um, em embrace this change, we need to make it easy for them. So I think both the suites, similar to what is in the duplex, um, they, each unit is going to have their own can, so I think the same should be afforded to the uh, host of the suite. Before I hand that over to staff for possible comments, I just want to plus different scenarios mm -hmm. there. So it's basically on the single family with sweet, um, it's the organic specific that you're thinking the 360 liter down to two 120 liters? No, because um, a single family with a sweet is still going to have the problem with the art waste. So they, they're still going to, in, in most cases, need to accommodate their yard waste in their organics. I just want the sweep. So I would go with the bigger organics for the uh, single family with the sweep and a small one, the, the one funny that could go to the sweep. So as is, I don't know what it is. No, so you would get three, you would get three one twenties. Uh, one 360 for organics, and you could do one 240 for recycling. Yeah. Uh, so over to Sia Wall, is there uh, any rationale or comments to consider for why there would be one uh, organics for homes with sweets? Before we contemplate that further. Yeah, so we've, uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, and I apologize, I hear my voice back and I think that uh, you're speaking sometimes, that's why I'm always pausing. Um, 
the decision to recommend moving towards the one last bin was really just around trying to save frontage space and reduce the amount of frontage space. So we understand that that's going to potentially introduce a number of conflicts uh, or could introduce a conflict around single family with suites. So we're recommending the one 360 organic spin that would be shared and then reducing the size of the recycling bins. Um, the reason for this is that when we are assigning the bins to each household, they're assigned to the owner of that property. They're not assigned to the suite. So the owner of that property would then have to provide access to the um, to the people in the suite or the families in the suite to have that, that access. Uh, now, as Councillor Swift points out, um, that's not the only way that this has to be done. You can go back to what the original plan was and what's being done in Courtney where everybody has their own individual cart. So it'll increase the amount of frontage space required, but it will decrease you know, the potential for conflict between um, homeowners and the renters. Now we do want to note that if council was to follow through with the recommendation that we have it in the report and homeowners did not want to have a shared organic spin, they would be able to come in and get the additional 120 liter organics for the suite without having to wait that six month period. Councilor, just to follow up on that commentary, but um, that would be, would that come at an additional cost? Yes, so it would come at an additional cost. Um, however, if we moved forward with the recommendation, the cost per the homeowner would be decreased. So there's no difference between giving them the extra, giving the homeowner with the suite that extra bin now versus purchasing it later. They would get a discount now under the staff recommendation because they have a lower cost, they have less streams. And if they purchase that extra stream, it would just go back up to what it would have been had we provided that originally, if that makes sense. Well, it, it makes more sense to me if you're giving if you're giving each duplex, each duplex is going to have one of each type. That a, a home with a suite should also have one of each type. Right now, yeah. the, the suite doesn't have any more downs. Yes, and that's fine from a staff perspective, if that's where council wants to go. Uh, the rationale that staff, uh, when we were looking at this, is that when you're getting into the duplexes and triplexes, each individual is the owner of their own um, property there. So the ability to pool or have one person responsible for the carts to ensure that there's access is a lot more difficult than when you have the homeowner of a suite. But to your point, um, absolutely, it is something that council can direct and to have um, an equitable, a more equitable distribution of carts between the homeowners suites versus the duplexes and triplexes. Yeah, and I would further recommend though that um, if you're, if that is the way we're to go, that the organics for the suite be a small one. So when we get to recommendations, that can be a recommendation that's made today and we'll make sure it's really specific on the sizes for the main suite, secondary suite. Thanks for that extra information about what could be purchased or changed in the amendments. So there's two different routes there. Uh, Councillor Blackwell. So just uh, to make sure we're all on the same page here, it's garbage and organics go out one week, and then the next week it's recycling and organics again, right? So we're alternating. Each week you're putting out two bins, whatever size, right, per unit. So if it's at the maximum you could have is four. So you you, you think of a four meter spacing, um, four meters of spacing plus the width of each of the cans. On some of these, we're going to get really close to the width of the lot. As it gets back to the uh, are the parking, you know, in the street parking. I had a discussion this afternoon with Craig Perry, and, and we discussed the reach of the, the trucks. You know, apparently they can reach 12 feet. Uh, so that's wider than most cars. Is there the ability for the the thing to know to reach between cars and 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 pick up a bin and dump it? Because if so, I think that would be excellent. To see that. <laughs> and that my, my next question would be once when, when are we going to see these automated trucks? Now I know we rolled this out in Nanaimo, uh, we, not us, but uh, people who live in Nanaimo have been, been dealing with these for a while. And it, it's after an initial uh, bump in time, it, it's worked quite well. 
Um, contrary to Councillor Swift, I would say my discussion this afternoon was around why only one big organics for houses with a suite. And the thinking was, well, if you have a single family house with a suite, you're responsible as the, the homeowner, usually the homeowner is responsible for the entire yard and the yard waste would all be going into the 360 liter and it wouldn't be a big deal for the, the tenant in the suite to just dump their small kitchen waste basket into that um, organics bin, which was going out every single week. Um, so I was fine with that. The, the thing I, I guess the only question I had besides can this thing flip, flip the bins between cars is um, how do our, how does this layout of, of container sizes per type of unit um, compare to Courtney's order? And second, um, how, are we stuck if you if we go with these these allocations? Uh, is every single homeowner or every single property type stuck with these allocations for the first six months as a trial? Just a quick comment. Um, page one fourteen. It, it's somewhat hard to see, but it has a chart of what Courtney's doing, and we're in the bracket. So where we say no cart, they have one hundred and twenty liters. So I think we're kind of similar to what uh, Councillor Swift is recommending. So there's two small differences between what Courtney and Comox is doing in organics and yard waste and two small changes on recycling. And that's on page 114. Thank you, Your Worship. That's correct. So absent direction from council today, what Comox will be doing would mirror exactly what Courtney is doing. Uh, and so the recommendation that we have today is to make a few uh, small changes, which are identified in that chart, as Mayor Minions um, has noted. Now, the other question is, can the arm pick up between cars as long as it has that requisite spacing? Um, yes, it can, and that's what it's designed to do. So as long as it has the spacing to do so, it should be able to, to, uh, to grab it. And I think there was a third question. I apologize, what was it? Are you, are you stuck with the, with the allocation for the first six months? Um, Thank you. And then, and then you make changes according to your individual property needs. Correct. It, and the reason for that, and uh, maybe I'll just note that um, Courtney had been planning to do that for six months and they're looking to extend it for a year. It's not something that we've talked about and in doing internally. And the reason for that and the reason for Courtney's thinking of extending it to a year is to allow people to experience a full season. Um, and the reason for having that time limit on is that people, what's happened in almost every jurisdiction that's rolled this out is that people are very upset for the first two months. Um, they really don't like it, but after month three or four, people get used to it. And from there, everybody, uh, the, you know, sort of the complaints go away. Everybody gets used to it and, and life goes on as normal. If you allow cart size changes immediately, what will happen is that you're just constantly trying to, to do it. And we don't have the administrative um, ability to, to manage it. So by putting that timeline on it, you hope that over the six months, everybody who can live with it, lives with it and the people who are still upset at six months can come in and get changes. Uh, there will be exceptions, you know, medical exceptions we will take a look at, but other than those sort of medical um, exceptions or if it's physically not possible to have it collected from a site, uh, we would ask people to, to use it for the, at least the first six months. Thanks for that comment, uh, Councillor Hazlitt. Uh, thank you, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, so you'd mentioned that Cumberland, uh, sort of while you mentioned that Cumberland is opted out, um, and MCARE is just going to be using decommissioned trucks uh, for as long as they can. Um, how long can they hold on to something? But how long can they hold on to that, and how long could it last? And what would be the potential cost of staying with um, staying with the old way? I think the last part of that question, what would be the cost to Comox if we decided to stay with the old way? Yeah. Um, I don't think we really have an option to stay with the old way. We, we joined the RFP that went out with the city of Courtney. We've signed the contract. So I don't think that that's on the table. If it's something that council wants to look at, we can, we can do so, but it would be breaking the contract that we have with MTERA for service provision. Uh, as far as Cumberland goes, it's good. I'm not sure how long they're going to be able to continue with the service as it is. Um, Director Ashfield might have a better memory than me, but Comox gets service for pickup 
every single day of the week, whereas Cumberland only gets pickup one day per week. So just to put it in sort of perspective of the number of units that are being collected, uh, it's, a, it's just vastly different. So they may be able to survive on one truck uh, for a long time. And that truck is probably servicing a few of the rural areas as well on private contracts. Um, but I'm not sure how long that will be able to continue, but they would only need one truck used temporarily to be able to do this, whereas Comox needs multiple trucks uh, and those trucks in service every single day. Thank you. And then my next question is, when we joined Fortney in the RFP for this, um, did we know that it was going to be a change in trucks and, the, and a change in bins and potentially um, the effect that it could have on citizens? Or was this more along the lines of we we're trying to find to just secure a garbage contract for the foreseeable future? Uh, Council did know that we'd be moving to an automated system by partnering with Courtney. At the time that this decision was made, we were experiencing pretty significant service interruptions both in the summer and winter because of continual truck breakdowns. So um, one of the one of the things that we found when we were analyzing this is that those side, lin side load trucks are not being made very much anymore. And the reason for that is because they have a higher operating cost. Um, and significant kind of wear and tear on the body as they're going. So most municipalities are switching to automated or semi-automated. Uh, and there was significant inability for uh, a number of summers to source the labor required to run the truck. So we were running into pretty significant backlogs and pickups. So both because of mechanical breakdowns and the inability to source labor, the decision was made to move to an automated pickup system. Thank you. And then, sorry, one more here, and this might not be the time for it, but with the change in trucks and the change in bins, is this, can this affect the way that the town is building the roads moving forward? Or, I don't know if it's the time for this question or not. Yeah, can I start. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I think that is the case. If we were to find, for example, that there are sub some subdivisions where um, because of spacing or curvatures that we're unable to get proper pickups where it's negatively impacting street parking that we would look at revising our standards and, and what we're doing to approve subdivisions in the future. Further questions for staff before we look at recommendations? Councillor Brown? Yeah, thank you. So I'm just looking at the 360 liter bin, and of course, I think that uh, Craig mentioned that there might be, uh, and like you need to, you need about five of those twice a year to put all your yard waste and, and tree branches and all the things that you trim. Other than that, you've got this giant bin for organics, and that's just going to be filled with stench and rot and filth in the bottom. And, you know, you can put probably five or six bodies in one of those things. Like, I don't know how you're going to get down and keep that thing clean. Is there any alternative to that? Like, I know he talked about twice a year being able to put unlimited organics out, which is, or, or yard waste out, which is good. But a 360 liter bin for, like, you know, I live on my own in the house. It would be five years before I filled that thing up. So, I, you know, there, there seems to be a gap here for me between... The twice a year one, I need a whole bunch of those, and the little one that I need for organics. Yeah, it's a really difficult choice to make, and it, it's the it, it's what we've gone back on and back and forth on with staff. It's what we've taken a look at um, regionally and other partners, and, and ultimately it comes up to making the decision of what's the right size, what's the right compromise. Do you want to provide um, that additional capacity at the three hundred and sixty? Do you say two hundred and forty is is where you want to go. I mean, alternatively, council, we could look at providing two organics bins. You could provide one 360 organics bin and one 120 organics bin. Um, and then people could choose to use the 360 for your yard waste and then the 120 for your, um, uh, for your kitchen waste, but only allowing one to be set out on any given, on any given day then what you would have is that you would have the 360 probably being used in the summer when you have yard yard waste, putting the organics in with the yard waste. And then when you get out of the summer seasons, you would just utilize the smaller uh, the smaller bin. Yeah, that actually makes sense. But um, 
is there how much consideration is there to having once or twice a year where we could put unlimited out? Uh, we are taking. Sorry, we are taking a look at that with them, Tara. It was priced into the contract, so it's something that council will be taking a look at and making a decision on um, towards the end of the uh, summer, end of summer, early fall. Uh, so, well, what would be the cost implication of adding? So it looks like we would just be adding a 120 liter bin. Is that a huge implication with the number of households we have or a relatively minor scheme? I'm not sure if there's an exact number or just a idea from staff on what the cost would be to provide two options? The bins are around, I want to say $200 per bin. So it would be $200 per home that we provide it to. Um, we, I, I can't see who's there. Is, is Jeff, does Jeffrey happen to be there in the, the background? Uh, no, that's more expensive than they cost. <laughs> the, no, the he's, he's not here today. The 120 liters may be um, cheaper than that, but yes, we could uh, we can find that um, find that for you. I, I, if I if you give me a minute, I may be able to to um, pull up some numbers here. Okay, so we'll just go on if that's okay with further questions. And if it happens to be over to you, I'll try to note it while you're looking and get your attention. So, other questions, Councillor Hazlitt, or comments? Um, just a question about the rollout. Um, is the community going to roll it out all at once or are we going to stage it? Um, I'm just thinking that if we were to roll it out all at once, you know, uh, the contractors at this point are, are pretty good at what they're doing. So they can move through the community pretty quickly. Whereas with new equipment, new bins, um, helping teach our residents to set things up appropriately so it's not causing more time to the impair employees to turn things around. Um, is there a thought to how it's being rolled out and if we are going to stagger it so that, you know, one of the new trucks comes through and hits, say, Foxwood, and then, you know, the rest of the community is being done by one of the older trucks. Um, so that we can kind of maybe eliminate any kind of pain points or something that the town can maybe say, hey, the bins need to go out like this so that nobody has to get out and we're not causing these backups in the but I'll uh, call on CAO Wall, but my understanding is going to be quite a few communications, and it's going to be one large rollout in the region at the same time, which is going to go nice and smoothly. But I, uh, I don't think there's a, a standard that would be pretty hard to manage also. So over to CAO Wall, the question was, would it be all at once, or would it be staggered as far as the rollout with Courtney and the automated things? I thank you, Mary I believe that the plan is to uh, implement everything at the same time, but I'll have to check into that and, and we'll find out from MTERA what their plan is. Um, one of the benefits of having a, a large provider like MTERA is that they've sort of managed these transitions a number of times and um, kind of know what has worked and what hasn't in other communities. Thank you. And just a quick question. So for on the timing, um, we have two kind of considerations here about uh, the size of organic spins for sweets and then just the size of organic spins in general. Um, are we at the point tonight where we need, you know, if we pass the motion, there could be changes in the next couple of weeks or really these bins are being ordered. And if, if we were to be unsure about the second bin per house, is that something that could be added um, at a future council date or is that something we really need to have decided this evening on quantity? I know the I know the main right. decision on the so the bin choices have to be decided tonight at this tonight's meeting. But if there's any question on if there should be two different options for um, sizes for the organics for household, what Councillor Grant brought up, is that something that also needs to be decided tonight? I I think if we were to get the main order in to to go and add that second one in would probably be okay. Although I know that they really want to get the numbers, and I was I, I was able to pull up. So if you give me one second. We'd be looking at five thousand, exactly. about five thousand seven hundred additional organics bins, and if the cost was about two hundred, uh, it's about a million dollars. That puts things into perspective a little bit. Now, the cost of that is recovered over the ten years. Um, 
So it, that seems like a really big number, but if we take that cost, divide it by the number of units, You know, we're probably only talking about $20 a year per household to provide that extra bin. $20 okay, so that would be to add to give the option of people having two organics, which mostly would look at yard waste, but that still wouldn't necessarily make up for that big bins. What I'm wondering though is, could I just buy a smaller bin and then trade them out as I want? Buy a bin from the from the company. Yeah, okay, the 200 bucks, I'll buy the bin and then I'll put out. You know, I'll, I won't put an extra bin in, but then I'll have to buy the bin. The cost up front always helps, but so CAO wall, will there be uh, some extra bins that would be able to be purchased by residents um, after the roll up? Yes, how many? The, the, so the plan right now is to have enough bins in order to cover replacement and the people that want to change them in. If we are talking about providing a service which would allow people to come in and get that additional organics bin, especially because the 120 organics are probably going to be one of the lower numbers we're ordering uh, because there's not many types of properties that are getting that 120 organics. Uh, we It may take a while to source them. So it may not be something you can come in and get right away, but if there was demand for it, absolutely, it's something that we could provide. Or we could have purchased a certain amount of, so that also puts into perspective when we're looking at suites, we know the rough cost of, um, I don't know how many suites, homes or suites there are, well, the cost of adding the second one. Councillor Swift. Um, <clears throat> well, I still like the idea of the 360 uh, bin for organic storage families because um, even though uh, my organics can easily fit in a 120 because my kitchen waste, it's probably not even fill up a 120. I've been doing it ever since the program started, and I often have my junk less than half full. Um, but uh, for people who do garden, I've, I've got friends when they cut their lawn this week and they've got their whole garbage pile plus two days. So, I think it's better to go bigger than smaller. It's frustrating if you have things that you have to hold over from one minute to the next. So I'm in support of all the single family homes, including the ones with suites, getting a three, at least one and sixty. Uh, yeah. Um, Other questions or comments, or I would ask if Councillor Swift wants to make a motion with the recommendation or changes, or anyone else wants to make a recommendation. Yes, so A to E, we can do one at a time. So, any other questions and comments before we go through each of these items? Okay, so we have single family homes getting one 120 liter garbage, one 360 liter recycling, and one 360 liter organics. Okay. Any questions or comments? Councillor Kerr. Just, just to, you know, let's go through this one more time. I mean, we, we really want people to use this program. And, and I've cleared the room. No. No offense taken. Um, <laughs> it's next on the agenda. This is, this is important. I mean, I, I think we really want to get this right. So I just want to think this through. We, we really want single family homes to use this program for people that have, I mean, people are going and just putting the little kitchen catchers out on the street now, right? So if we only provide them with the 360, the giant one, I, I see a lot of a lot of families in town just not even bother, and they're just going to throw stuff out. 
Um, or they're going to put the little ones out and then they're not, not going to get picked up and they're going to just say, okay, enough of this. So the idea, just to flush this out, the idea of having the additional 120 organics uh, in addition to the large 360 organics. So we, we can communicate that easily to the public. Here's for your yard waste. Here's for your kitchen waste. Very, very clear messaging. It's more cost. They only think we're doing. Can you not have them grow together? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm at a loss. <laughs> Mayor, I'll just stop talking. It's so challenging to start getting away our Just, if if the if people because right now people have all different types of things they have garbage bins that have like spray painted yard waste on them and so just to be clear for public that are listening to this that have left the room um, thanks thanks Bob for being here thank you um, if like all other types of bins other than those that are there all other types of bins will not be picked up by the new service is that correct okay thank you. So we have to get this size of combined organics and food waste accurate with all the different usages in the community. Councilor Mayor. I, I just want to like ensure that everybody knows it's going to be okay. Like lots of communities have, have done this. And I think I think it even says in this report, we're not going to get it 100% right for, for everybody. I, and I, I just, I feel like staff have uh, put in a lot of time and consideration um, in, into both the recommendation as well as like the flexibility required. So it like, for sure, it's going to be bumpy for three months, um, but people will figure it out. And I, I have faith in our communications team as well. Thank you for that addition. It does feel like a big decision at the end of the day. It's something that we'll transition into after a couple months of growing pains, all of us and everyone in the room that lives in Gomox. Okay, so we have the 360 liter organics uh, on the floor. It sounds like there could be changes over time. It would take some time. Uh, do I have a motion or? Okay, and then a second, yes. Okay, so all those in favor of A as put forward. So that passes unanimously, thank you. Number B, single family with suites. They have two, we have two 120 liter garbage, two 240 liter recycling, and one 360 liter organics. And there's been some discussion on that. We have a motion, Councillor Swift. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to make a motion to um it's called garbage, but what I'm talking about is one 120 organics. Two, one twenty garbage, two, one three sixty organics. This is me. <laughs> All the same. Uh, yes, it's set up to say, and, and maybe uh, Councillor Hazlitt could uh, weigh in on this one. Um, with the single family, your your recycling um, container is reduced. Over the single family, just the regular regular single family. I, I'm fine with the suite having a 240, but perhaps there should be a 240 or 260. Okay. For discussion from anyone on the 120 year organics addition for suite and the possibility that the recycling may be larger for the main suite, those two points. I think Councillor Hazlitt and then Councillor Mayor. Um, I think the two 120 liter garbage should be sufficient. I would think that a 240 and a 360 for recycling would be a good way to go because even though you've got a suite in your place, you're still you know, the same amount of recycling, single family plus some. So I think, and with more and more the amount of people 
purchasing things on Amazon. Eleven trucks showing up at my house every day. Um, and Steve's house. Um, I think you need to have you need to have a, a big recycling container, especially every two weeks. So a two forty and a three sixty, and I think I think that you need. I can't quite wrap my head around the one. 360 liter organics. Um, I understand that single family house is going to have all their yard waste and likely they're not going to fill it every week. Um, but dumping out your kitchen scrap into it, if you're a steep, isn't really going to do that much, although it's going to be pretty good. But I think I could, yeah, I would, I would like to make a motion that we would do two 120 liter garbage containers. One 240 liter recycling and one 360 liter recycling and one 360 liter of that. Yeah. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor and comments. Yeah. I was trying to do a motion. <laughs> <laughs> and it was to have the uh the addition of the one one twenty for organic. Just a clarification for process, there was not a motion on the floor and we were open for discussion and then a motion was made and seconded. So just want to check for clarification. Oh, I thought I thought I was in the middle of trying to craft the motion. It did get passed over before. So I just want to check okay. for clarification just because we did actually um well I'm there was intent and then there was <laughs> <laughs> Uh, over to CAO wall, or if a motion wasn't made and then a motion was made and seconded, is the one on the floor need to be struck down first? Thank or you, Worship. Um, if what, uh, so you would make the ruling on this, but I believe what you are saying is that the uh, original motion by Councillor Swift wasn't seconded, and then Councillor Hazlitt made a motion that was seconded. Uh, there wasn't a motion. I guess there was an intent for a motion, but I didn't quite catch that. Uh, and then a motion was made and seconded. So uh, I, it does seem like there's a motion that's been seconded. We can look at that or strike. We can either approve, strike down, but I, I didn't hear a motion being made on the first round. So uh, Councillor Hazlitt's motion can stand, but we will uh, discuss and vote on that. Can you hear what Councillor Swift has to say and then... Of course. Well, I, I'm okay, except, well, what what my motion would have said would be, I'd like two uh, 120 garbage, one 240 recycling, one 360 recycling, one 360 organics, and one 120 organics. Thank you for that addition. So it sounds like the differences between the 120 organics on the suite from the two kind of uh, discussions we've had. And over to Shelly for comments. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I think that you have it correct there. And if Council wants to have a discussion on that extra 120 liter for the suite, uh, I would. Maybe just recommend that an amending motion be made and council can have a discussion on that. That's a, a specific man. Okay, so just to clarify, it would be an amending motion. Yes, you should, council should Please. make, if you wish to discuss it, you can make a, uh, an amendment to the motion and add the 120 liter uh, organics for suites. And just to clarify, uh, Councillor Hazlitt's was an amendment uh, to the staff recommendation. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Councillor Brown. So okay. one of the reasons I was querying on the single family houses and whether we could swap a bin out, it, it's very similar to this. Like you could actually go and purchase a smaller bin if you have a host of estate. And that's what I was asking for that exact same reason on the single family. So I think it's covered off in that if you find that what we have here isn't adequate, you can always go buy another smaller organic bin. That's why I was asking that question. I already know it's not everything, and I can't get it. I don't need it. I'll second Council Swift's motion. I'm not trying to difficult, but if we can have Councillor Swift make the uh, 
motion amendment. <coughs> and it was it was advised to do that, but not done. Okay. I'd like to move that we do two 120 garbage cans, one 240 recycling can, one 360 recycling, one 360 organics, and one 120 organics. And just to clarify, you're making an amendment to the motion, and we would then need a seconder to the amendment. Councillor Hazlitt's motion is on the floor now. So staff has asked us to make an amendment to the motion, okay. which so, you just made. Okay. So I need a second. Perfect. So now we're going to discuss the amendment, and we will vote on the amendment, and then go from there. If I can keep track, Councillor Hazlitt. I would be happy to support Councillor Swift's amendment to the motion. Further comments on voting on the amendment, which includes the 120 liters be included up front versus being purchased later by homeowners, which seems to be the discussion point. Councillor Mayor. I'm actually pretty agnostic. I just want to note, like, I believe that the intention from staff was to try to reduce the amount of space that this was going to take up on the road front. Because now when we look at what we're getting compared to Courtney, we're we're almost basically doing what what Courtney did with the exception of one thing. So, just making sure that everybody understands that the the trade off is actually the space on the road. Thank you for that uh, comment, and Councillor Kirk. Would a uh, if we if we accept this amendment, would a owner slash tenant be able to return the unused bin if they if their tenant relations are fine? It's easy. You know, side entrance to the house where everyone is dumped into the same bin. Could they return the 120, have a savings on their taxes, and just use the 360 together? I'll send that to staff, but I believe the bin would already be purchased. But <laughs> we're not uh, over to staff, would someone be able to return if, if the amendment was uh, voted and approved? Would a bin be able to be returned to town hall? And I guess there's two parts returned or returned with credit. Uh, he, that is a good question. I can say that right now, Council, you do not allow that. Now, it uh, it wouldn't make sense in a system that we have because we don't have the carts that are out. But you don't you do not allow um, residents or suites to opt out of a garbage service. And and I can tell you that we would have a lot of requests coming in for that to happen. So it's something we can take a look at. But it, it would be something that would be requested, I think, quite significantly through the community. So I'm just wondering who owns the bin? The bin is owned to start by MTERA, and then as they're paid off through fees, they would be owned by the town. So if I move out of my house and take my bins, uh, well, that's going to happen for sure. So how do you get it? So do you have to then go buy new bins? So the bins are assigned to a property. They're not the they're not actually owned by the residents, and you're buying the service from the municipality every year. And through the cost of that service, we recover the cost of the bins. So if you leave your home, you wouldn't take your bins with you. <laughs> they're they're now a chattel. <laughs> it's a side note for consideration because it will happen somehow. Sure. I just want to speak quickly. I've had a couple properties with suites, and I see both sides. That I do have a real concern for the spacing uh, between, and I, I would uh, favor having the one bin, and then if someone wants to purchase the one twenty, we are taking into consideration the spacing, um, and that is in consideration of having that situation before. Uh, other comments on we're going to be voting on the amendment, Councillor Blackbox. So I would speak against the amended motion just because I think if we're giving if we're giving them two bins and they can pick which one they want, we're charging them for both, then they, we're offering maybe a chance to return one. That's sort of a reverse billing situation where you're giving people more than they need. I think it's easier to be able to recognize they're going to need a second bin and go get it and put it on put it on the property and do that. 
so we can see where this motion goes, but that can be maybe a subsequent or something we consider is how do we make sure an upper order that can be purchased for those who decide it's easier for tenants and it is going to be a one but very distinct depending on your situation with your tenants and suites. There's no perfect option here. Uh, okay, so voting on the amendment to the motion, which is to add uh, the 360 liter recycling as well as the 240 liter recycling and then the 360 liter organics and the 120 liter organics. That's the amendment to the motion. All those in favor and opposed. Okay, so that amendment is defeated. So we are now going to vote on the motion that is on the floor, which is the single family with suite. Two 120 liter garbage. Uh, there's a 240 liter recycling, a 360 liter recycling, which is the added bin, and the one 360 liter organics. So that is the motion on the floor. And we will just go to the vote. So all those in favor of that motion. And opposed? Councillor Swift and Councillor Hazlitt. Opposed? Who is your motion? Check in. We're back on the original motion. Uh, yes, we'll oppose it because I there. support council's right. That makes sense, actually. Thank you. Just to clarify, so uh, that passes, and everyone is clear as mud. So we're moving on to C. These are important sessions. We're moving on to C. All those in favor. That passes unanimously. Uh, D for triplex, quadplex. And uh, all those in favor, or sorry, discussion. All those in favor, that passes unanimously. And curbside, multifamily, E. I'll get a motion. A seconder. Councillor, yeah, of course, question. Do we know how many units are considered? Curbside multifamily is, I assume we're meaning strata titled townhouses with direct street frontage. Is that how many units would that be? Uh, go to CAO wall, CAO wall for what the definition is. And if we know approximately how many units, I know they're still going through the process of checking, which will be able to go through automatically. Yeah, correct, Mayor Minions. We're waiting for MTERA to provide us those numbers. Um, basically, the process we're working under right now is that if you are able to receive curbside collection, then you must receive curbside collection. Uh, what those numbers are going to be and how it breaks down is going to be up to MTERA's decision on which units they can service and have the required frontage. Um, there's going to be some interesting decisions that may need to be made if um, certain units are getting, for example, recycling right now, uh, and it may be determined that they're not able to move to a full suite of um, pickup services, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do in those specific circumstances, but we need MTERA to provide us that data first. It's still in the works. Okay, so all of those in favor of the curbside multifamily burden from what we have so far. Perfect, that passes unanimously, unanimously. Just a quick question to staff. So if we were to look at wanting to have a X quantity of 120 liter extra organic bins, is there kind of a buffer for all of these? Is there an extra number of each of the bins that's gonna be purchased or something staff would be considering before we look at the number for potential suite purchases? Is there an overage that's planned for each of these bins? Correct, there's an overage that's going to be planned um, and decided by MTERA. If there is a certain style of bin that we would want to make sure that there are additionals of, uh, we can, and we will be letting MTERA know that this is what we're planning to do for single family homes with suites, and that we will be allowing them to purchase the additional um, service right away so that they may want to have a few extra of those on hand. Does anyone want any extra comments on that number just to make sure it's kind of our will is reported um, for having those extra bins available earlier on? Councillor Swift. Um, so then, um, could I have two 120s rather than one 260 right off the bat though? Sorry, could you have two, three, sorry, two 360 two, organics? No, no, no. Two 120 organics rather than one 360. Uh, no, you would get your 360 organics and then you'd be able to get the additional 120 organics for the suite. 
Okay, but what if they want to get rid of the 360? You'll have to wait the three, the six months and okay. then you can get rid of the, the 360. And, and how do I do that? You would just come into town hall and say, at the when the six months are up, you'd come into town hall and say, I'd like to make a switch for the 120. And somebody will come and pick this thing up? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so it sounds like just from uh, around the council table, there's some interest to make sure there's some 120 liter bins based on the challenging decision on the family suite that was made. So that can just be noted, but it doesn't sound like we need a motion. And uh, to encourage Ontario to ensure there's extra of each of the bins for any errors that come up and not having service delays for people that have immediate or medical needs in the very beginning there. We do still probably have a good hour left between a couple of different presentations and camera, et cetera. So we'll just take a very quick five minute break just because it's been two and a half hours and we will return and thank you for the discussion on that. That is an important discussion.
Okay, so returning back to the agenda. Thanks, everybody. We're on page 116, and we have an introductory report on the official community plan amendment for 2077 Hector Road and 941 Aspen Road. There is two recommendations here that in accordance with section 475 of the Local Government Act, the notice of proposed official community plan amendment as contained in attachment one to the June 7th, 2023 planning report on RZ OCP 23-2 be posted on the town's bulletin board website until replaced by a notice of public hearing. Part B, June 7th, planning report on RZ OCP 23-2 be posted on the town website. And that number two, that when a public hearing is scheduled for the pro proposed development on the subject properties, that an option for online participation is added. Now in that report, there is some also alternate to the recommendation. So I'll open that up for comments. Okay, so we have a mover of one A and B. And any comments or questions on that motion? Councillor Mayor, you are. Sorry, for process. So so now we get to discuss kind of the whole. So the application is just, I should have clarified possibly. Perhaps. So it's in a stage three where there, and please correct me if I'm incorrect, but there is an application in. None of the details are in front of council. It is part of the local government act. Uh, a developer can do or is, um, I don't know what the right word is, but does an OPCP amendment as part of the process. Uh, and the two recommendation alignments are whether we go through add in additional consultation or not, but this is all part of the local government act. We don't actually have. Well, the application is in. We have not really seen the plans. If I can confirmation, yeah. so there's not much on um, the plans we can discuss. But they have under the local government act uh, the OCP plan amendment, which will lead to a public hearing. So it's the console piece that we're discussing tonight. Gotcha. So, so I I would I prefer the alternative to the recommendation because of the uh, um, size and scope of this, it feels important that the governing bodies for the organizations that are noted um, in number four under the alternate to the recommendation that they be notified. Thank you. So what we'll do is I believe there was a motion, a mover and a seconder on the motion. So uh, either, uh, when we get to that, that can be defeated or amended. I just want to check with staff in that report. It did have uh, those parties that we should consult with uh, Comox First Nation, school district, CBRD, um, and some of them had like response dates and no response dates. So is it correct that we have already, you know, some initial consultation with them, but the alternative would be more in depth, con like it would, it would involve a more in depth consultation, but that we have done, they have been notified of this um, application. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mayor Minions. Yes, <clears throat> we've engaged with all of those organizations on a staff level. Um, whether or not the, that has been forwarded from a staff level to a governing body level, I can't say for sure in each organization. And the decision you have in front of you is whether or not you would like to send a message directly to the governing body for them to consider this development. Okay, thank you very much. I would also support uh, that additional consultation while forwarding this forward. So other comments um, or questions, just over to staff for process. If it was an alternative one, would we still be able to pass 1A, 1B, and add that as a secondary motion? Or would we be looking at either, it would we be amending 1A and 1B to include that now, if that was something council wanted to do? I think it might be simpler, Your Worship, to just defeat this motion and pass 1A, 1B, the alternatives in the whole, rather than getting into amendments, but it's up to you. Okay, thank you. So from staff, if uh, the alternative A is something um, that those uh, that councillors maybe wish looking to vote for, we would turn down the motion. And if not, you would uh, look at the motion on the table and be approving that. So further comments on the motion on the floor. Councillor has slipped and then Councillor Swift. 
so with respect to alternative one, where we'd be sending it over to the CBRG board, the court and council, the Comox chief and council, and the school district's board, I, I understand that this has been sent over on a staff level. Um, and maybe this is a question for CAO Wall, but in that area, has Courtney or the CBRD or, or, or the Comox Nation sent anything like this over towards us as well, or is it strictly due to scope of project? Over to CAO Wall, is it something we would similar? See similarly from uh, those organizations, or is this something based on scope that's an uh, option for us in Comox, or possibly something we may see in future in our municipalities? Yeah, Director Commons can maybe fill in a little bit more of the history, but technically, or <clears throat> sorry, not technically, um, typically what we would see is referrals coming over to a staff and then staff bringing them up to council if we thought it was something that you should uh, consider. But uh, maybe Director Commons can add a little bit more color to that answer. Uh, correct. There, um, the general protocol for individual uh, developments like this is to send it to staff, and that way, um, if it is not a major issue for the organization, then they can respond, or they can then decide um, that it is, and they'll send it to their board council. We already have uh, been notified that the CBRD staff will be forwarding that to their board for a board resolution. Thank you for that. And based on the timelines of when a public hearing would come up um, in future, I know those take time anyway, an amendment would take time. Would, would staff see this really slowing down things or would it just be an uh, additional layer that it would kind of add or you would give a timeline that would it slow down the process over all the alternative recommendation one of adding those referrals? Um, in no. summary, does a referral add a lot of time or is it basically just additional information but not time? Uh, no, it does not add, it should not add a, to, uh, a lot of time. It just adds um, additional work um, on the receiving organization. Thank you. And our organization as well, or more on the receiving? More work on our organization? No. More specifically there. So. Good to know. Councilor Blackwell. Uh, I would speak just in favor of the original uh, recommendation from the CEO. This uh, this proposal of CP amendment has gone out to staff of all the uh, referral agencies, and I believe that we should let them do their jobs and send these up to their boards if they feel necessary. I know, um, you know, if, if there was a uh, similar size application in Courtney, I expect that if it came to our staff, our staff would elevate it to us. So let's trust our partners to our neighbors to do their jobs and uh, just go with the original motion. Their comments and feedback. Councilor Swift. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Councilor Blackhawk. <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, what kind of information I, I can see sending it forward for information, but I don't know what kind of participation the other boards might have in this. Uh, and then I'm also concerned uh, school boards going out for the summer and so on. I don't know what the timing on some of this would be. So I, I think it's best to, to trust their staff and let your staff manage it and see where it goes from there. Any other comments? Seems I would also be in favor of the alternative. I think there's quite a few things happening and sometimes things go through the cracks. So I think as long as the referral is not speeding up the timeline and it's not too um, encumbersome that the referral they have the option of either opting in or opting out and allowing the governing bodies to have a chance to put input. I think that's a good way to have. Uh, so I'll vote against the motion. And other bad counselor car. I'm wondering if maybe the, the board or bo uh, boards or councils might be looked at separately. Um, you know, I, I look at them, uh, the school district certainly would have a um, nice letting them know of the impact potentially of the number of additional students in that catchment area uh, might be might be really useful to them uh, to have it at a board level. I, I really understand what Council Blackhawk is saying that we trust the staff to, to elevate that. But on this one, because of the scope and the size, um, I think from, from council to board or council, council 
does make sense for these, especially the school board and also the Comox First Nation to have it come directly from us. So, um, yeah, I would be supportive of a wider consultation and then I guess against this motion. Okay, so we will vote on the motion on the floor. No, we will not. Councillor Mayor. I, I just have other questions and protest why it's like is now no time to ask them. Possibly, so please ask. Yeah, it's better <laughs> to ask. Yeah, so um, kind of a little bit further down under council decisions, there's this point about having a town public information meeting in addition to the public hearing. But I don't think that's included in the motion. I'm not sure that it needs to be. So I, I guess my question is, um, when, where in the process do we talk about that? So that's question one. And then question two is really just, I know buried in here, um, the, the kind of steps of, of how this goes from here are laid out. But I think that maybe the, a lot of the questions that, that people in community have um, are, are about like the, the times when, when people get to, to comment and weigh in. I guess I still don't feel totally confident that I understand the full process from here. And I don't, same thing. I'm not sure if now is the time to kind of go through that or not. Yeah, I think the first question uh, can definitely go over to staff and then I'll leave context if it's general development process, like process in general, that might be something that goes offline, but I'll pass it over to CAO Wall and <coughs> on the community, community meeting um, that was mentioned is when that would get uh, discussed. Thank you, Mayor Minions, through to Councillor Mayor. I'll talk first around the, the sort of general um, processes. We are planning to bring council presentation to your next RCM in, uh, I believe it's going to be July, and to walk through what the development, the major development process and decision points and timelines are going to be, understanding that this is the first of what we expect to be men, many major applications that are going to be hitting council's desk. So that will be a good time to go through the process in detail. Um, and, and I'm sorry, that when you mentioned which part of the, the report you were looking at, I, I couldn't hear exactly what you said. So if you mind saying that again. Sure. It's page 119 underneath council decision, there's three lovely hearted bullet points there. And the third one says, uh, have a town public information meeting in addition to the public hearing. And that's on page 119? It is. I must I'll be working off. Thank you. Um, but that, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna turn that over to, um, Director of Planning, if he can comment a little bit about uh, whether it's appropriate now and the difference between setting up those sort of open houses at this point or doing it later in the process. Thank you. Um, the, at this point, um, what council knows is you have a, you have a, it, um, a rezoning application for multifamily a certain size of community. Um, that's a general category. What the province is doing is, is, is at this point saying, hey, based on the general category, what people should counsel is over. So that's the subject of this report. When, um, in terms of public consultation, it would be prudent to at first get the initial um, report on the application, understand what it is. It would allow us to then also advise at the open house to what the issues are. And also council may decide, um, part of this is if council sees merit in moving it forward to something like first reading, if then they would then forward it as well as after first reading. Um, if they don't see merit in it, then the, there's really no point in going to the uh, public itself. So yes, um, so what I would recommend, it will become a lot clearer um, to get the first report, see all that's in the first report, 
um, and then decide if you want an open house. You can also then decide if you, how you wish to structure that open house based on the questions you may have for the public. And so, yeah, it sounds like July 9th is when are you supposed to be able to draw up more information? Yeah. Yeah. Possibly separate. Um, yeah, we would uh, anticipate the report first and second reading of the, the initial report on the application um, coming forward in September. Okay, so correction, not in July. Yeah. That seems awfully soon. Yeah. <laughs> So we have a motion on the table, which is the staff recommendation, uh, which does not uh, include the full referrals to the governing bodies, but does uh, include the consult so far with uh, staff at those organizations. So uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, we were voting on the staff recommendation, which is on the table. Uh, I'll just call that one more time, just so it's nice and clear. Hopefully, sorry. Uh, all those in favor of the motion and opposed. So the staff recommendation passes. So number two, that when a public hearing is scheduled for the proposed development on the subject properties, an option for an online participation is added, and there is details about the cost and the staffing on that. And perfect, that's been seconded. And comments or questions? All those in favor? That's great. And so, again, to anyone watching, that uh, information is coming sometime in early fall, but that application is not in front of council. And we were just passing the uh, required officially official community plan amendment um, as contained in the report. Thank you for that discussion. So we're moving on. There is no notices of motion uh, correspondence. Uh, we have Ken Price from, uh, sorry, Chief Ken Price from Comox First Nation seeking partner support for National Indigenous Peoples Day, which is coming up on June 21st. Uh, that's on page 370. If I can get a motion to receive the correspondence in a second. All those in favor of receipt. Yeah, thank you. And any discussion on the letter that's provided there? They are asking for uh, volunteers, funds, or partners, etc. Thank you, Worship. Maybe I'll just make a comment. Um, I we've reached out to KFN to learn a little bit more about which uh, what volunteers they're looking for. Um, Director Russell, are you able to add any information on uh, what type of volunteers they are looking for? Um, yeah, they are looking for assistance in their food use, and you know, they're looking for assistance with traffic control. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Food booths and traffic control. Right. Um, this is something, Council, if you wish to give direction that we believe we will be able to assist KFN with. Uh, just to confirm, is that from a, because I know elected officials, we've received the invitation, which is due on by Friday for those who are able to attend to add to their sessions, but this volunteer request would come from a staff level? When you say that's something we would be able to assist with, sorry. We're just getting oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is something the town would be able to supply um, some labor to if council were to direct us to do so. And, so, and I don't mean that council would be the ones um, providing that labor. It would be staff. Sorry. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> we've been invited to the celebration for a couple of years, and I don't think we've provided um, that volunteer support before. So that's great to hear. Um, I think that that would help move that motion. That if staff is able to support on that day, it would be great to see uh, Comox there in different capacities. So that's uh, I would move that. Okay, so discussion around that. Now, just to get a bit more information, <laughs> how many staff would be we be looking at providing on that day just to kind of understand where, where it's at? Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm not sure exactly. It's something we'll get into discussion with uh, KFN on, and I, I don't think it's a too onerous of a request. I know that the same request has gone out to the City of Courtney as well as Cumberland, and I believe they're planning to assist as well. So I don't think it's going to be um, a major a major issue for us. 
Okay, and I'm not sure if staff will be able to answer this, but did the CBRD provide funding to this day around 20,000? Apologies, I don't know that. Okay, around the table, it looks like it was approximately 20,000. So just trying to get a kind of a picture of, of uh, how the day is coming together. Uh, Councillor Swift and then Councillor Mayor, and we do have a motion on the table to support with volunteers in whatever capacity town is able. I, d I just wanted to make it the comment that I think that's really great if we can send people because we have uh, so little money that we can use to support these things that are really support building relationships. And I think, you know, having having volunteers work together is a really great way to do it. So thank you for that. Thanks for those comments. Any further comments? Sorry, Councillor Mayor. Yeah, I, I just concur. I think um, this is a really great way to, sh to both show support, but also like just kind of referencing our conversation about reconciliation earlier. Um, it's times like this, I think, that uh, really show reconciliation in action. So I'm, I'm just really supportive of staff being part of that day and um, suspect that it will be much more than just volunteer um, kind of experience. Thanks. Great, thank you. So all those in favor of supporting uh, some volunteer coordination between the town of Comox and National Indigenous People Day on June 21st. Great, so that passes unanimously. And for a quick reminder again, Friday, June 9th is the deadline to RSVP. So I'm looking forward to spending some time down there on that day. Councillor Kirk. Just one, one last thing on this. I'm sure we're, we're already going to do this, but um, they also asked for some communication support in promoting the event. And I would just uh, assume that our amazing communications team would continue to promote this event as well. News releases going out uh, from our communications manager. Perfect. And all counselors can share uh, the event information. It seems like they've got a great event coordinator really on things this year. So perfect. Thank you for that. I just need to find my voice again. So we have uh, Lisa Dennis from the CVRD, Comox Valley Emergency Program, Extended Services Establishment, Establishment Bylaw. We're on page 371 of the leave package that the town of Comox consent to the adoption of the Comox Valley Regional District Bylaw number 766 being Comox Valley Emergency Program Extended Service Establishment Bylaw 1991, Amendment number four under section 346 of the Local Government Act. Questions, comments? All those in favor? That passes unanimously, thank you very much. Moving on, we have a uh, communication from Steve Thiessen from the Comox Men's Shed in regards to the Ukrainian tree dedication ceremony. I saw this tree in Mackenzie Park the other day, I believe. I believe they're looking for support. Uh, in the event sometime in the fall, or not the event, but the tree. Oh, there it is, August 24th, Ukraine Independence Day. And just to clarify, sorry, sorry, that's been moved and seconded. And a quick uh, question to staff, I believe that's from our parks department and communications department. They're looking for some light support of, of around that event. Is that correct? There's no monetary request attached. Okay, so we um, will move that we support that uh, event on August 24th, which is the tree that's planted for the yeah. All those in favor? Perfect, thank you very much. That passes unanimously. Had a really good system going on two pages, but I lost my system. <laughs> so now we have page possibly 380. Bradley Little from 19 Wayne Comox is looking for a flyby request for 103rd birthday. So it's the town of Comox is supportive of a flyby by the Canadian Armed Forces aircraft 
as low as 500 feet for the 103rd birthday event being held at 618 Anderton Road for transit practice and shows on June 30th, 2023. Seconder? All those in favor, sorry, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously, thank you. And uh, lastly, but important, we have from Doug Fillion, Courtney Counselor, the Mental Health Program Support Request. So this request comes in to the Village of Cumberland and to the CVRD, as well as Comox First Nation. The City of Courtney is applying for uh, their community, or sorry, the community of Courtney for our region, region to be selected uh, for a PAC team, which is a peer assisted care team. And there is basically from CMH, CMHA, uh, a recommendation from our community to support this application. So we are looking for um, basically a motion that we may as a town of Comox submit uh, on the link, their support, and then also we'll follow up with the coalition and just make sure that that was the appropriate um, support, but it is something they're looking for ASAP. So basically we're supporting Courtney being looked at for these peer assisted uh, care teams, which has to do with mental health crisis on the ground. <laughs> and all those in favor? Um, yes, sorry, just, questions and comments? Just, just I, I, mean, I, I expect this to pass, but you know, we had a bit of a discussion about this, what this actually means with the coalition and homelessness today. And um, it really is gonna be a support for the downtown community in Courtney and, and in particular businesses. Uh, there, so if someone is having a mental health crisis or something happening in their store or at the storefront, uh, there'll be uh, like a rapid response team um, of people trained in this area to de-escalate and help the individual out, uh, very you know person-centered way. Um, and sometimes that is a better response than sending police, who often have limited uh, tools and in, in, in ways to deal with these crises. So. Um, yeah, so I think this is, this is really great in a way for us to support Courtney's application for this. Fingers crossed that they receive funding for it. Thanks for sharing the update from the meeting today. That's important. And we can look at, um, yeah, who other people in the community may be able to support that recommendation. Uh, all those in favor of supporting Courtney in their PAC application? Great. Thank you very much. Believe that was the last of the correspondence. So there's no late items. We'll go through reports from member of council uh, briefly, but to share any important items, we'll start with Councillor Blacklock, go to Swift and Hazlitt first, please. Uh, briefly, I uh, attended the community performance of the Taiwanese acrobat troop on the 6th. I also attended a, uh, unfortunately, I was away last week, but I, I did attend. Uh, uh, a meeting through uh, Aaron McKinnon getting updates on the minutes for the Community Justice Center, as well as um, through Carrie, and, uh, sorry, um, Ms. Ms. Hackett of the Substance Use Strategy with respect to updates on the uh, phase three of the Substance Use Strategy that I am now going to be reporting to you guys on the regular basis on. And that's it for me. Thank you, Councilor. <clears throat> Thank you. I attended uh, an emergency preparedness meeting in my own neighborhood. So our neighborhood is uh, organizing, uh, getting together in the event of an emergency. So that was when we this thing that kind of fell off the table through COVID and they're breathing new life into it. I also attended the academic summit, uh, the Gilbert Ford meeting, and the stage commission meeting. Thank you, Council Hazard. I don't quite remember when this was, but I believe that was with all the other councillors for the planning meeting. Um, I attended a not today's uh, meeting with a couple of guys who think put together a disc golf tournament on side with the same dates as not today's, as well as a North Island College brewery graduation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kerr. Okay, thank you. Um, so. Uh, again, uh, the strategic planning session we had uh, with Council was two days. I uh, enjoyed, enjoyed that very much. Um, CAO Wall and I visited the Comox Library recently to discuss some staff safety concerns, and they have had an increase in visible homelessness in Comox and how that's affecting the use of the library. 
Uh, so we talked about strategies around that. I hosted a community engagement session at Clover Park. Uh, probably one of the coolest things uh, I've done in this life as official is attended the Comox Lake Encounters Canoe Tour of the, on the Comox Lake, of course, to learn about the region's watershed. That was a great uh, uh, session. Elected officials, community partners, leaders uh, to talk about uh, watershed and uh, conservation. Uh, I attended along with Councillor Swift the Beaufort Avenue Neighborhood Gathering uh, as our clinic is in the same neighborhood as, as Councillor Swift. Um, and Jim from the Comox Fire Service gave a great presentation. Uh, I attended the Highland graduate graduation ceremony in Tilburg Park on behalf of the town. Uh, I took a walking tour of the Neptune Way Aspen Road neighborhood with some residents to talk about uh, the on-street parking concerns they had. And um, attended the Cooperative Housing Working Group meeting discussing uh, some options for cooperative housing uh, at the Glacier View uh, site. Attended the Vancouver Island Regional Board meeting. I was uh, thrilled to get beat by Councillor Blackhawk uh, with Mayor Minion referee at their table, new table tennis court that's at Anderson Park. So hope to have a rematch at some point if I'm so granted. Uh, I attended the Coalition and Homelessness meeting today. Uh, spoke with some volunteers from the Brooklyn Creek Watershed Society, and there's 2,700 coho slopes were counted this year, which is way up from last year, which was zero. So that's really exciting. And then at CBRD, we had a waste management board meeting, recreation commission, sewage commission, water commission, and two CBRD board meetings. One highlight that I want to share, just as, as we look forward uh, and some of the developments that are coming our way. There's currently about between 1,100 and 1,400 childcare spaces in the Comox Valley. It's currently a two to three year wait list. So about 400 kids are on the wait list for childcare space. And they're projecting by 2029, we'll need 3,565 spaces. So that's a huge increase, uh, the tripling of the number of childcare spaces needed. So something for us to have in the back of our minds. Thanks. You can use it. The theme was uh, clearly different this time. It was about housing, infrastructure, and taxes. Um, every community across our country is having infrastructure issues and housing issues and tax issues. And it was really clear at, at many of these presentations that the local communities need a place at the table when making these decisions between the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipalities. We can't be left out. And uh, I think one of the best comments there was that the uh, federal government has the money, the provincial government has the power, and we have the problems. And so um, that was a really clear thing through everything was we need to be there and we need to be given funding to to look after a lot of these projects that's unencumbered. And so I thought that um, maybe something we could think about for the future before UBCM or the next FCM is a resolution uh, around permanent unencumbered funding for infrastructure renewal. Uh, I suggested this to one of the area directors uh, about emergency services uh, for the RD to bring too. So I think those might be something we could do. Another interesting uh, thing that I found out was when you're talking about the next generation of housing, cooperators insurance, you've probably heard of them, they have an investment arm. And as long as you're as long as they're um, invested in the infrastructure bank of Canada, cooperators will actually lend municipalities and municipalities money for some of this stuff. So I thought that was an interesting little date, which needs a little more looking into. Um, I also attended the sewer the, uh, the water and at water, we're doing a 50 year master plan for the valley. So that's coming up. Regional Park Service, um, we really just set the strategy for the service. And the RD board, which uh, at the RD board, we set the, or the regional area set a public hearing for the uh, Saratoga Speedway. They, they want to reach home and go to the campsites. Um, spend a lot of time talking about social planner and their role in the community health network. And that's my report. Um, mine will be short. I did a lot of things with y'all, like strategic planning, the Taiwanese acting show, that's fabulous. 
Um, I attended a webinar yesterday with Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, it was called Local Leaders for Mental Health. That was um, very interesting. And she actually spent a lot of time talking about misinformation and how important it is for us to address misinformation. Um, there will be a recording um, shared, so I can I can check that out for everybody. Um, I attended a museum board meeting. Um, I was not able to go on a new trip because I uh, was nursing a couple of injuries, but I did attend the regional parks meeting yesterday. I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks so much. I uh, attended the strategic planning session with all of you and looking forward to seeing the outcome from that. It was a really positive day and a half together. I uh, attended an, an Amterra tech presentation. They've been donating and I think the total was about $30,000 over the last uh, dozen years or so towards the Comox Valley Hospital Foundation. And that comes out of all of our recycling that they collect. They put a certain uh, percentage towards funding and they give a check to the Comox Valley Hospital Foundation for needed equipment at our hospital there. Uh, sat down with Jordan, CAO Wall, and the BIA just to go over our uh, grant funding and future opportunity for our downtown uh, plan. And they were really happy to hear that out of their initiatives that they shared with us, that one will come to fruition sometime in the next year. So basically review of the presentation they gave to us and just how we have some, um, some of the bigger wins and fits that match together with the BIA and us. And that was with Pete Chambers and Laura. I met with uh, Charlene Enns, who's our medical health officer for North Island. It's been a couple of years since she's come to our council to see how the last few years has gone. She's going to be coming as a delegation uh, either in July or August just to share kind of where our community is at with health findings. So I won't share too much, but they have recently hired a climate scientist who is giving recommendations on how that affects uh, the health and well-being of residents. Um, I did ask her just out of curiosity kind of what the biggest concern was from the medical health profession in the regions and the province. Um, and they said that alcohol was uh, the big trend right now. And they talked about different consumptions and areas and it's really concerning them right now about the number that's grown in the last three years. So I thought it would be opiates. Um, but she said that uh, alcohol is killing seven times more people indirectly and directly than to be at this. So their big concern right now equal to the opioid crisis, not to put an unhappy thing on the list. It was interesting to talk to her and I did invite her to come to council and speak with everybody just to give a 10 minute delegation on where things are at with our community and other communities. Uh, attended the ICT meeting, which is the uh, Islands Economic Trust. They were concerned about long-term viability. There's a business case for $150 million, which would allow the uh, trust to stay long-term in perpetuity, which the other regions of BC do have, and the Islands Trust does not. Uh, they were given $10 million uh, just basically to make sure that they could stay open in the short term, but the trust itself is still looking for that long-term investment and still trying to advocate for that. So um, all the municipalities um, from that table are sending letters encouraging the provincial government to fund that trust properly, but it does give the trust another five to 10 years of um, being around. So I'm not sure if that's good news or not good news, but it's not closing as they were looking at potentially having to do. Attended Cumberland's May Day celebration. They had a parade and uh, the May, they, they had a whole bunch of celebrations basically for a full day. It was a fun day out for anyone that uh, made it out there. I know this Saturday, June 10th, they're celebrating an anniversary. I think it's their 125th, but it's called We Belong. Um, and they have a full, another full day of festivities. I love it. It's always fun, fun and fun that they do their events. So I'm going to check out what's happening there this Saturday. I did a tour of the Marine Service Building uh, with Mike Springer the other day just to get an update on where that was at. Uh, they're about three weeks out from getting the keys to the building. So they're really starting to work on the outside and the inside structures are almost all finished. So uh, we'll make sure that everyone gets a tour of that closer too. It's a bit of a construction site still. And I'm sure staff will be updating us on where um, the leases are as they have with my emails, but it's getting, we're within the month of it being done. So it's a really beautiful uh, building inside. It's got two accessible washrooms, which we had asked for. 
Um, and it's uh, coming really close to fruition. And from the inside, looking out, all the views from the windows, and it's, it's a really beautiful building inside. So we'll share that with everybody soon. Uh, the Lions Club Comox Valley, which is just located up on Comox Valley, the Lions Den there donated uh, a forty-four thousand dollar donation to uh, Mackenzie Park, which is over on Quarry Road. That park's getting a big, uh, I think it's not a retrofit, but it's getting a new park there. And one of the features was now with that donation, it's going to be there's some accessibility features for um, those who have, um, I believe, in wheelchairs or different. Um, yeah, so it'll, it'll be more of an accessible part and the Lions donated to have all of the rubber, um, or what you call it, $44,000 of rubber matting going to that park. So we did the announcement the other day, but when that park opened in late August or early September, we're thinking of having more of the community council and anyone who wants to come to the park opening uh, come out. But the other day was the check presentation to announce that great donation. Just to mention, they do bingo every Friday night up at the... Lions Den and, it, and they were telling us about it and it sounds very fun. So yeah. <laughs> anyone wants to try bingo it's every Friday night in our community and that is where that donation came from. So BC Gaming, but from their bingo night. So that was fun to mention. Uh, last night I attended the Highland High School Bursary Awards night to give out the Hamilton Mackling bursary of $500. Um, and that was a really nice night. There was lots of really proud parents and got to watch. I think there was probably about 50 awards handed out, about $95,000 to $100,000. It's kind of just nice to see the energy. Councillor Kerr's daughter got an award last night, which was nice to see for athletics and her age group. Congratulations. Uh, met with a couple of residents, uh, different different issues, a couple of bylaw concerns, accessibility parking, and just getting um, if we're trying to communicate uh, more often with residents as they are approaching us. That's mine, and I don't believe we have any media here tonight. Any public questions? Yeah, do you mind? Touche. Do you do you mind using your mic then? And of course, you okay, earned just, a question. There was no discussion about reducing the volume of garbage and recycling. I don't know if there's anything going on in that way or not. Yeah, I would I, maybe through staff, but we like the waste management service, which is run with Comox Valley Regional District and Strathcona Regional District, which is also the whole Campbell River area. We're one group for waste management. They kind of run any like education and uh, they have they set targets and goals for how to divert waste and where we're at. So composting was the number one thing that was indicated for diversion and getting numbers down. But you're right, I mean, Town of Comox can definitely either be sharing what the regional districts are doing, but they run kind of the education programs and set the budgets for how to actually look at getting less in there. But us moving to um, the system that we moved to was intended to have. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to, yeah, please chip in. Yeah, so I didn't have to waste, that's a great correction question, Rob. I the waste management board talk a lot about diversion and, and even if you, you know, looking behind you at the size of the bins, you know, tiny little garbage bin, big recycling and organic bin. So we're trying to, I mean, as, as a valley, as a community to divert away from the landfill. Um, cause that's where the greenhouse you know, gas emissions are created and, uh, using the composting and the recycling to do that. So. You know, I think that's that's been standard across, and all the communities are kind of one of those smaller garbage and bigger organics. And there's never, you know, there's always more education and more talking about it we can do. But something that we voted on two years ago or so was to go to the every other week, which the intent was to try to just naturally get people to um, have better habits around recycling and composting. So that was the intent of going to every other week, among other things. Yeah. So that would be something that we could, you know, look at for advocacy. Um, we tried single use plastics a couple of years ago and we got kind of <laughs> hit with COVID and a couple other things. So hopefully the federal government is moving on that as they've said they will. We have tried municipally to move the marker on that and it, it, it's hard with the big plastics. So thank you for that comment. <laughs> Thanks for the comment. 
So that's good to, you know, sometimes people might not realize why we're doing the changes we're doing. So it's a good reminder to make sure that we're putting that in communications. We have a great communication team. So. Okay, so I'll get a, we're not going to go in camera yet. Um, so I'll get, can I adjourn the meeting and then I'll go into the camera after? Perfect, so I'll get a motion to adjourn the meeting. The seconder, all those in favor?